present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Andre Melly in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you, thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we welcome back Andre Melly, who will once again try and do battle with our three regular and tough competitors of the game. And we're going to begin the show this week with Clement Freud, but before we do, let me remind you that they have to speak, if they can, for just a minute on some subject that I will give them without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject. Clement, the subject is polo. You have 60 seconds, and you start now. The other day I was driving to Ascot Racecourse and passing Windsor, I saw a notice which said, Polo today, rather like frying tonight. And I turned off and for the first time I witnessed this amazing game on which men and women sit on horses with mallets hitting balls. Walk, trot, canter, controlled gallop of the sort of paces at which you might put your steed after the ivory along the lawn, and the thing is divided up into chuckers, which are time elements taking about 15 to 18, occasionally 20 minutes. South America is a game, is a place. Um, Andre Mary No, hesitation. Yes. Hesitation, I agree, Andre. So you, you have, have polo. Oh, so thank you. She's got it. There are 14 seconds left, Andre, for you to talk about polo, having gained a point for a correct challenge, and you start now. Well, it's a sort of hockey on horseback, played by frightfully grand people, and you have to be awfully rich, because you need a lot of ponies, so that you use one followed by another. At the end... <laughs> Well, Ian Messiter blows his whistle after 60 seconds, and whoever speaking at that moment gains an extra point, and on this occasion it was Andre Merry. So, Andre, the end of that round, you have a commanding lead. In fact, two of them have yet to speak, and one of them is Kenneth Well, hello, Williams. Kenneth. Hello, <laughs> Peter. How very kind of you to acknowledge me in that gallant fashion. Well, Kenneth, we're going to hear from you now, because we'd like you to take the next round, and the subject is my strength. <laughs> Talk about it, and if necessary, no, don't demonstrate it. Um, we have 60 seconds, and you start now. It would be quite easy to summarise it. My strength is, as it were, one equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to seek, to strive, to find, and not to yield, even in the early morning, to eat that boiled egg, Whip off its head with a sharp whack of the knife, and then a curiosity. Um, Clement Freud has challenged. Deviation. Why? Boiled eggs don't have heads. <laughs> Hard enough to tell their tops from their bottoms. <laughs> I think... Maybe I'll for you, mate, but I know it's said from its bottom. <laughs> I think, colloquially speaking, you can refer to the top or the bottom or the head or the tail. Quite right. So, can Very it? good chairman. Lovely fellow. <laughs> Just you wait till I give a decision against him in a few moments. <laughs> Kenneth, you keep the subject. You have 35 seconds left for my strength starting now. And in the army, they thought it wasn't really up to standard, so I was sent to a physical development centre at Hereford. The place was called Bradbury Lines, and I was forced every morning to go into a field, unroll a blanket, and do what was termed remedial exercises. And an officer said... Twinkle your toes, make them go up and down rhythmically. This will improve the strength of your feet and you will make an excellent infantryman. When my posting came, however, it was not to such a regiment. How oh, no! I was sent to the Royal Engineers. <laughs> So Kenneth Williams is in f starting in fine form this week because he started with my strength and in spite of one interruption, he finished with my strength. He was showing his strength in just a minute this week. You've got two points. I'm leading then. With Andre Melly. Oh. So you're equal with Andre Melly at the end of that round and Peter Jones, we're now going to hear from you. The subject, cowboys. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute starting now? Well, they are men who look after cattle in America. They wear chaps and buckles with huge belts attached and they shoot guns, rifles, and they have a tremendous reputation for toughness, which is not altogether deserved, I suppose, but why, why the... 
And Andre Merritt. Uh, hesitation. It was definitely hesitation. Uh, yes, it was yes. a kerfuffle which was interpreted as a hesitation. Mm. So, Andre, you have the subject of cowboys, and there are 42 seconds left starting now. At the last count, there were 19 cowboys in our house. I found two in the bath, one in my bed, and three down the lavatory. <laughs> my son, aged five calls them all Jane. When I asked him, saying I thought it a bit strange, why weren't they Dan, Ben, or even Fred, he had no answer at all, and I'm extremely worried at the psychological implications of a small boy thinking that all cowboys are called by that particular name. If... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Uh, repetition of name. Yes, you mentioned the name before, the word name. And Peter got in there with ten seconds to go. And cowboys is now back with you. Peter, starting now. Across the states of Wyoming and North Dakota, these extraordinary figures ride about on rather small horses. They're not the huge... <laughs> So, Peter Jones got uh, points in that round, also one for speaking when the whistle went, and he has now, he's, well, he's in second place with Kenneth, one behind Andre Melly, who's still in the lead, and Andre, your turn to begin. The subject, my last hat. Will you tell us something about your last hat in just a minute, starting now? My last hat was a complete disaster, which is not surprising because the one before that was even worse. I just don't seem very good at buying them. This particular one had a high crown and a wide brim and was a little like those worn by a certain princess. We all know extremely well. And it was for a wedding. Uh, no, I tell uh, a Peter lie. Peter Jones. Well, well, I don't know any princess extremely well. <laughs> so <laughs> <I'd> be... <laughs> Deviation. I think she meant that we all know extremely well from her pictures in the newspapers. Well, elsewhere. she didn't say that, you no. see. No, but no, she, she didn't, didn't say personally know very well either, so she, she wasn't actually deviating. No, but from I'm, my last I'm, hat. Naturally, I'm trying to score points, so I, you know, any, op <laughs> any opportunity that is offered like that, I and naturally I'm seize naturally it. trying to be fair because of all the things you say to me both if I'm not. So well, I've never criticised you for giving me a point. No. <laughs> Nobody else has, but quite the reverse occurs. And, Andre, you have another point and you keep the subject 37 seconds. My last hat starting now. It was for a bar mitzvah. And the extraordinary thing was that all the other women were in... Uh, uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. She said before it was for a wedding and now she's changed it to bar mitzvah. And I the two are not the same thing. It what was, was a dual event for economy's <laughs> sake. <laughs> called a double header. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kenneth, you have a correct challenge and you have 33 seconds for my last hat starting now. It was waterproof and I obtained it from a leading manufacturer of such articles and did not expect it to leak. However, this particular night, which was a booze up, I came out in the street, not a taxi to be found. There I was, stoked. Soaked. I said, <laughs> soaked. I meant to say, I meant to say soaked, but I said yeah. stoked. <laughs> I was stoked, really. You were stoned and soaked. Ah, yes. <laughs> Who challenged me? Andre Melly. Oh, well, she's yeah. right. Yes, yes, she was, yes. <laughs> I think you were giving a demonstration of how you were at the particular time. Andre, the yes. subject's back with you. Fourteen and a half seconds, my last hat starting now. When I finished with my last hat, I gave it to Kenneth Williams because his leaked and he got stoked in it. And I felt that really it wasn't fair. I mean, there he was in the road, in the rain. What could he do without something on top of his titfer? So if he messed uh, it, that's uh, Peter the Jones, Peter got in. Uh, he couldn't be on top of his titfer. He wouldn't yeah. have another hat on top of his titfer. Just the is, is, no, no. is one hat. No, if you rent someone a hat, they don't put yes. it on top of their own hat. So mm -hmm. I give you that one, Peter, and you have one second on my last hat starting now. It was a boat hat. <laughs> Andre is still in the lead. Peter Jones only one point behind. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. And the subject that Ian Mess has thought of is pognophobia. Pognophobia. So would you talk about it, if you can? <laughs> can we talk about either? Yes, as I've given you both. There are 60 seconds starting now. Pogonophobia is tremendously on the increase at the moment. And it is 
Of course, viciousness on the part of chess players is manifested by people throwing their knights at the other's queen, or even pushing their king viciously towards the bishop of their opponent. Police cells at the moment are chock-a-block with pogonophobics. Uh, Andre Merritt. Uh, repetition a moment. There were two. There was at the moment and, and a moment. Then, just a moment. Yes, there was another moment there. So mm. would you like to tell us something about pogonophobia in 37 seconds, starting now? Pogonophobia actually is the fear of not understanding what words mean. And it's something that I suffer from very much. And uh, Clement Freud's challenge? Deviation. It is perfectly it's correct. It is deviation. <clears throat> we won't tell them what it is, because we'll let them find out. Um, and you have the subject back, uh, Clement, with 29 seconds left, starting now. If you're going to talk about actual definitions, pogonophobia is the fear of beards, especially by people who have tender skins and are frightened lest a hirsute face. Uh, Andre Mellet. No, Clement Freud, you've challenged yourself. No, I haven't. No, oh, well, I on, well, your light came on, but Andre pressed. What it's is it? deviation, because it's not about that at all. It is. It is a fear of beards. Pogonophobia is a fear of beards. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons we chose it for Clement Freud. And uh, he has 18 seconds to continue on pogonophobia starting now. But really, any hair can instill such phobia or fright into the recipient who rubs whatever section of her anatomy, or even his, against such a growth <laughs> from wherever on the body it might come from, if you don't um, mind my Peter ending. Jones. Hesitation. Yes, I would agree. Yes, well, it's pogonophobia. But between words. Yes. You would like me to elide one straight into no, the other? No, no, there's no other place that you can Slowed hesitate up terribly, except between I mean, words. Was, uh, grinding to a halt, wasn't he? Grinding slowly, dead yes, down, yes. which is yes. definitely. <laughs> and, uh, Peter, you got in against a game with only two seconds to go this time. It's pognophobia with, pognophobia with you starting now. Artificial beards don't count, but they... Well, uh, Peter Jones is now in the lead alongside Andre Melly at the end of that round. And Kenneth Williams, we're back with you to start. And the subject, Edward VII. We know your interest in history, so will you tell us something about him in just a minute, starting now? Well, undoubtedly, he was a source of great embarrassment to his mother, owing to the fact that he did have two appearances in court. And this did cause a great scandal. Um, Clement Freud. Hesitation. You're That's afraid fine. you did. Mm. And so um, uh, there are 47 seconds for Clement to continue on Edward... Sorry, take up the subject of Edward VII starting now. Edward VII was, of course, every pogonophobic's pin-up. His beard, which is lush. Uh, Kenneth Williams' challenge. Well, if pogonophobia is what he's told us it is, a hatred of beards, yes. he wouldn't be anybody's pin-up because he had one. quite agree. That's Thank you very, very much. <laughs> And there have never heard of masochism. I don't wish to argue with you. I don't wish to argue with you. The chairman has made a decision and I abide by the chair. <laughs> when it's in your favour. He's good looking to boot, isn't he? <laughs> he wants to boot. <laughs> Kenneth, you have 41 and a half seconds. Edward VII starting now. He was the son of Queen Victoria, and she said at the time, well, never let the memory of Albert be dimmed, and gave the name to several of her children, not all of whom used it as the first, but she also said even the rooms should be endearing in terms of the... the, the uh, <laughs> Clement Freud. Hesitation. Clement, there are 13 seconds left. Edward VII starting now. It was perhaps one of the most extraordinary things when Edward VII appeared in court because he was accused of something very common, a crime which very few people have appeared in court of royal blood. And Andre mm -hmm. Mellon. Repetition of two courts. Yes, well, he did appear well, twice. Well, I noticed that, but yes. I was dying to find out what he was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> he appeared twice in two courts. Andre, with one second to go, you got in on Edward VII starting now. He was on the telly for weeks. <laughs> Peter, the subject which occurs... A, 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 <laughs> 
<laughs> Repeatedly in this programme, the unexpected. That is the subject, and there's just a minute in which to talk about it starting now. The unexpected is all right, except when it's guests. People, in other words, who have been invited during some euphoric, expansive, ebullient mood, and then weeks later, in a depressed period, when one is rather sad and perhaps short of money, the cash flow is slowed down to a standstill, they appear on the doorstep and crave admission and very likely a meal to boot. Well, that is one of the unexpected things that I never really enjoy. Much as I enjoy having... <laughs> Uh, Andre Mary Challenge. A repetition of enjoy. He said enjoyed the first time and enjoy the second. No, it, did I didn't hear that. Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> the unexpected is still with you, Peter, with 18 seconds. Sorry, 23 seconds, starting now. The only thing to do is to smile and make a clean breast of it and say, come on, we are going out to dinner. And you then go to the nearest fish and chip shop or <laughs> takeaway, go inside and eat it, or else you go to the park and find a bench and there you uh, consume. Kenneth Williams. Deviation, he said. Go to a takeaway restaurant. Then he says, go inside and eat it. Now, this is a contradiction in terms. You either take it away in a takeaway restaurant that was in the or you go in and shop. order a meal. You, you, you can't do, have both. You it's can. ludicrous. Oh, yes, you, you can. can. You yeah. can. Why is it called takeaway? A great knit. Because if you're going to you go are. in and sit there. <laughs> you can buy it and throw it away if you want. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Who in this day and age has got the time or the money to go and throw food away in the streets? Kenneth, I disagree with your challenge. Uh, Talia expected one, by the way. And there are four seconds for you to continue, Peter, starting now. Nowadays, there are more unexpected things happening than ever before in the whole... <laughs> so, Peter jo Jones, starting with the unexpected, finished with the unexpected, in spite of a number of challenges which gave him points, so he's now in the lead. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject, Clement, a balanced meal. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? I suppose you could call the head of an egg and the heel of a cucumber a balanced meal. <laughs> but I would personally use... Um, Andre Miller. No hesitation there. No, it wasn't. Oh, it was a hesitation, oh. quite definitely. It definitely Everyone oh. knows it was a hesitation. Oh. He'd said this about the edge of the egg about three times, and he was getting very self-conscious about it. And Andre <laughs> Melly was very observant. She could see that hesitation coming a mile off, and so could I. And he knows it was. That's why he's gone red. Look at him. He's red. <laughs> admit your guilt. Go on, admit it. You, you were hesitating, weren't you? <laughs> you can't why didn't you tell that? when a pognophobia... Phobic uh, blushes beneath a beard. Pogonophobic. <laughs> Pogonophobic. <laughs> I'm going to stick to the other pronunciation. Clement, I disagree with them. I don't think you were hesitating on this occasion, and you have a balanced meal still, and you have 52 seconds starting now. These days, a balanced meal doesn't really apply, <laughs> because basically there are so many forms of vitamin tablets and other aids that any meal that you have whenever is sufficiently balanced. The lights have gone on, thank you very much. Um, soup, fish, meat, sweet was the original concept of a balanced meal. And you took vitamin tablets before and a little saccharine or artificial uh, Peter sweetener. Jones, a challenge. He mentioned vitamin tablets yes, before. Yes. Yes. yes, he did. And Peter, you've now got a balanced meal. Right. And uh, you have right. 27 right. seconds in which to talk about it starting now. One of the difficulties of eating a balanced meal at a buffet supper is balancing it on the knee with a knife and fork in either hand, a glass perhaps on the other joint, and further than that, you have the neck. Uh, Clement Freud. Deviation. Why? Well, you shouldn't take a joint to a party. <laughs> 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 it would be in... I think by any score, he was deviating from a balanced meal. It sounded very, very strange to me. So, Clement, you have the subject back with 13 seconds, starting now. A, B, C, D, especially the third one of those, give a man all the nourishment that he needs, although the odd woman does like to have sago pudding. Um, Kenneth Williams is Deviation, A, B, C, and D, give, all, give a man all the nourishment he needs, means absolutely nothing. It's not even English, it's deviation. It could mean yes. anything, couldn't it? Thank so you very much. you have a balanced meal and two seconds to go starting now. It's what you eat on the tightrope when you're in the circle. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, will you begin the next round? The subject, when I'm cornered. 
Well, I could tell you what you do, but uh, you tell us what you think happens in just a minute, starting now. Well, this will have to be hypothetical, but the simple reason is that I've never been in a boxing ring in my life, and therefore has not occurred, realistically speaking. Any answer I give will be purely conjectural. If I were cornered, I would lash out with everything in my power. Fists would be going as well as the elbows and the legs and, of course, the knees, which can administer certain grave physical disabilities upon any adversary with whom you might be matched in this existence. On the other hand, should you be cornered in a verbal sense, then the essence of defense is attack. Get out there with everything going, every gun fired. <laughs> Well, you see what happens when he really is cornered. Everything goes, because he was cornered, he said, with the subject to start with, and he kept going for 60 seconds without being interrupted. He gets a point for speaking when the whistle went and a bonus point for achieving that distinction. And Andre Melly, your turn to begin. The subject ties. Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? I remember when I was about seven, my grandmother said to me that a very great friend of hers, who was 72, could not leave Liverpool because she had ties. And I thought that this was a kind of disease which was so terrible and disgusting that perhaps one couldn't explain exactly what it meant. It was later that I realized that people of a certain age and sometimes younger are tied to the town or part of the country where they were born. And you you cannot uproot these people and send them somewhere uh, else. This is Clement something Freud, that the government... Should should repetition of people. Yes. yes um, she was well, on people, a I mean, people who need people <laughs> are the luckiest people in the world. People, it's a wonderful number, that. Right. Isn't it? I mean, you do feel it. You've just been listening to Top of the Pops and... Uh, <laughs> That was Kenneth Williams' new number, which is now at number 147 <laughs> and going down rapidly. <laughs> but in just a minute, uh, Clement Freud challenge. He had a correct challenge on people, which was a repetition, and he has now 27 seconds to talk about ties starting now. Ties are pieces of material which are tied round people's necks in one or other knot according to the fashion of the day. I personally have over 100 in a cupboard, but only ever wear two, the first belonging to the Lord's Taverners, because it is faded and nobody can see what emblem is depicted on it. And the other is an old Etonian tie to which I'm not entitled. I purchased it in San Francisco from a man... And why somebody here didn't challenge him at that moment when he said he only has two ties, he's not wearing either of the ones he described. <laughs> it was the, one of the easiest challenges, but Clement Freud wasn't challenged. He kept going, and so he gained that extra point for speaking when the whistle went. I must now tell you what the final score is, as we have no more time. And um, Andre Mele, returning after uh, quite a, an absence, did extremely well. And she, <laughs> no, she was fourth place, but she was only two points behind Kenneth Williams. And he was only one point behind this week's joint winners, Clement Freud and Peter Jones. We do hope that you have enjoyed listening to Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. Chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd.
We present Kenneth Williams, Peter Jones, Sheila Hancock and William Rushton in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Hello. Welcome to Just a Minute. And I would like to take this opportunity right away on behalf of all of us here. I'm wishing everybody a very happy Christmas. And I'm going to ask our four panellists to speak again, if they can for 60 seconds on some subject that I will give them without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And we'll begin the show this week with Peter Jones. Peter, the subject is crackers. Can you talk on that for just a minute, starting now? Well, I have known a number of crackers over the years. <laughs> one of them lived in Ilfracombe. <laughs> <very well. laughs> and another one was resident in Nottingham, which is a city famous for that type of uh, person. I think, and there was a pub there where, uh, well, I bet... Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Williams was just... Well, an awful lot of her. Kenneth, you have a correct challenge, you get a point for that, so you take over the subject now, and there are 40 seconds left on crackers starting now. Well, this can be a slang term denoting insanity, or a mild form of scatterbrained idiocy, and it can be one of those things you pull at parties and out for little bonos and party pieces and plastic little tricks which are delightful and called howls of laughter and giggles round the table. Oh, the joy of seeing the holly up and all the lovely pieces of paper with the silver tinsel around. Uh, William Rushton has challenged. Yeah, I've never seen a holly up a cracker. So to speak. <laughs> It depends on your cracker. I bet that up uh, Peter Jones is. Um, uh, William, what actually is your challenge then? Hesitation, repetition or deviation? Yes, indeed. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and in that order. <laughs> William hasn't played the game so often, but after his triumphs of last time, I thought he might have been a bit more specific. Deviation I... will suffice. Yes, well, I don't think he was a devious thought, but he wasn't deviating from the subject. But it was a very nice challenge. Let's give William Rushton a bonus point for giving us such good value with this challenge. But leave the subject with Kenneth Williams and Crackers is with you. Ten seconds, starting now. And out of them, I usually find a delightfully coloured paper hat. And I put it on. Um, Sheila, yes. We've had lots of paper. We have bits of paper yes, coming that's right. out of the bottom. We've had the paper those. before, Kenneth. And so a correct challenge is right of you to remember these things. Yes, yes very well. Good. It's very nice when we start a new game. She's keeping her adrenaline flowing, isn't she? <laughs> straight out the knife box, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> um, five seconds, Sheila, for you to talk on crackers starting now. I once had a little cat called Crackers because he did somersaults and chased after balls of wool. <laughs> The whistle tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever is speaking at that moment gains the extra point. On this occasion, it was Sheila Hancock. And at the end of that round, Sheila Hancock has got two points and Kenneth Williams got two points, so they're equal in the lead. William Rushton has won, Peter has yet to score, and Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. The subject, my best day ever. Would you tell us something about that, if you can remember it, starting now? My best day ever, I suppose, was their deep humility when I did become another kind of human being. That person who is subliminally conscious of a deeper motivation to a life than hitherto was ever experienced. In the middle of Ceylon, a huge, great earthquake-like thing called Elephant Rock reared its head and up on the top there I met a Tibetan who told me one of the great secrets of the universe. He said that when the setting sun shone its golden rays upon the Shwedagon pagoda, a deep truth would be revealed. He <laughs> hesitated. Hesitated. He hesitated. There was hesitation only three seconds ago, and we were all chuckling. That's why he blew cool. <laughs> Peter, no three seconds for you on the best day I ever had, starting now. It is, of course, yet to be. Next week, I hope. And... 
Well, Kenneth did extremely well, but alas, Scott, uh, Peter got in with three seconds to go. He got the point for speaking, and the whistle went. Right. He's now equal in the lead with Sheila Hancock and Kenneth Williams. Sheila, the next subject is the perfect guest. Will you tell us something about him in 60 seconds, starting now? The perfect guest will be someone who would give me the end of Kenneth's story, because I'm dying to know what the monk actually said. However, I also like people who are, don't demand anything of you, but just enjoy themselves. I hate people that leap to their feet and say, can I help you with the washing up? Because invariably, I don't do it anyway. I leave it till the next morning. And all it does is give me great feelings of guilt that I'm not... Uh, doing it. And uh, Kenneth Williams' has chance. I'm very dreadful hesitation there. You have a correct challenge, Kenneth, and you have 35 seconds on the perfect guest starting now. The perfect guest is someone who remembers that everything in your home was bought with your own sacrifice and your hard work. Uh. It's not someone who grinds their feet into your carpet. It's not... Uh, Sheila Hancock has As chance. far as I know, Kenneth never allows anybody to go into his house in case they put ash in his ashtray. Yeah, but... <laughs> the, only, the only time Sheila. I ever went, he said, don't you dare put ash in my ashtray. Don't you sit there. So well, I don't think he ever has any guests. Well, perfect I know, I know, but the thing is, Sheila, that may be perfectly true, but the, the answer is that Kenneth is still searching for the perfect <laughs> That's guest. That's true, I wasn't. <laughs> and it, this could be his perfect guest, even if he's never been to his house. So he wasn't deviating, and he keeps the subject, and there are 20 seconds left starting now. He arrives at the proper time, not late, and, of course, we don't want him early. He also sits absolutely still without moving the feet in this wild and uncontrollable fashion which sets everybody else's nerves on edge and his conversation is everywhere. Oh dear. Oh, Kenneth, if you any... shouldn't have said that. If... You're being inundated with requests. Anyway, Kenneth kept going with his perfect guest with also speaking with the whistle when got that extra point has now got a good lead at the end of that round. In other words, Kenneth, you have leapt into a commanding lead. Ah, the result of virtue and hard work, you see. <laughs> Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The subject is balancing the books. Will you tell us something about that in 60 seconds, starting now? Well, I've been trying to do that for many years with the aid of my accountant, but I can't really get anywhere near making the two sides equal. And I'm always getting unpleasant surprises and sometimes visits from the tax people who are always pestering me because things are in a state of confusion. And balancing the books is something that I feel is not natural to an ordinary human being because we are irrational and we can try and save, for instance, fivepence by walking to work and then buying something on the way because we happen to see it in a shop window, which we wouldn't have done if we'd been in a taxi. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of thing is always causing me a lot of trouble and mm -hmm. inconvenience. And the authorities are suspicious. They come from all over the country, knocking at the door, sending letters of various colors, blue demands, red, and sometimes registered. <laughs> That's the first time that's happened for a long time. Someone started with the subject and finished with the subject, didn't hesitate, repeat himself or deviate. He wasn't challenged, so he gets two points. One for speaking when the whistle went and one for keeping going for 60 seconds. Congratulations, Peter. Thank you very much. It's kind of you. Thank you so much. Yes. yes. Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. The subject is Cicero. Will you tell us something about him in 60 seconds, starting now? Well, he's a contemporary of Catullus, of course, who was extremely epicurean, but Cicero undoubtedly is much more influenced by the stoical school of philosophy, which maintains, as he does in his writings, especially on friendship, that the true virtue lies in the altruistic, the knowledge that the duty is to be done regardless of whether it gives you pleasure or not. That is to say, the morality consists of wrong and right being inalienable, uh, incapable of modification. Uh, William Rushton is being extravagantly dull, anything. I mean, it is. Yes, extravagantly dull. 
And I mean, that I, was boring. I really that was dull. What talking about. <laughs> More dull than boring. And yes, uninformative. And lies. You see... <laughs> I'll throw that in as well. <laughs> Otherwise, splendid. Cicero is one of the... <laughs> And Cicero was supposed to have written jokes as well. So that doesn't sound very funny to me. Um, I think you were going Who on a bit, write, and I think it was a little bit uh, off the subject. So well, you we... go on a bit, too. and You're always dull, but they don't chuck you off. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't chucked you off. If you, you don't know anything about Cicero anyway. I know it probably as much as you do. You know nothing. You couldn't name one of the works, could you? See a, a cheap trick dropping the case there, trying so that you look as though he's filling in. You know what I mean? Could no answer at all. Couldn't name a line, could you? Cicero? Yes, presidium minus equirium o optimum omnes quit. <laughs> Rushton has the subject of Cicero. Cicero was, of course, best known for his oratory. He was a master of tub-thumping. He would stand up in the Senate in Rome in his toga and engage them for hours on some of the most boring, dull, stupid issues of the day. They would all drop off, go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> so William Rushton kept going then to the whistle. He got an extra point and he's now... Uh, he's in third place now. I thought he outboard Kenneth. I oh, know. <laughs> no, no, I thought he spoke rather loud for once. Um, <laughs> Sheila, the subject is compassion. Will you tell us something on that in 60 seconds, starting now? Well, I think as I'm sitting in fourth place, I am deserving of a bit of compassion. So here I go. It's strange that you should choose this subject because I was thinking only the other day what quality I would most prefer my children to have, and I finally decided that I would like compassion because I feel that with that quality, the world would be a better place, because it would mean that each human being would respect one another, and not only other people, but towards oneself, because occasionally people are too harsh on their own selves, and they feel guilty about things which they shouldn't, and children particularly. Uh, Kenneth Williams, a child. We've had children and people twice. Yes. yes, I'm afraid you did have children before. It was a very compassionate complete, and... Um, We've all gone very quiet, haven't we? <laughs> well, it. after all, it is Christmas. <laughs> there are 24 seconds, uh, Kenneth, for you to talk on the subject of compassion starting now. Well, one of the most compassionate, of course, was St. Francis. I mean, the one of Assisi and not Xavier. And in a train once, a gentleman asked, to fellow traveller, what was particular about him? And he said, well, he talked to the birds and the bees and the animals and was a friend to everyone. It was delightful. Really, I never realised that he was that kind of fellow. And the other man... <laughs> that whistle ruined it. That whistle ruined it, because I was this man said who was St. Francis, and the other man explained who he was. And then he said to the other bloke, where are you from? And he said, San Francisco. Oh, I thought you were talking about Cicero still. Of course, we ought to have a game called Just Five Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, William Rushton, we're back with you, and the subject is useless inventions. You tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now. It has been said that necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yes. um, um, hesitation, repetition, and deviation. Yeah. <laughs> Two points. Oh, go on. You were a bit late. I'm afraid Sheila got in before uh, you. Sheila, what was your challenge? A hesitation. That was a correct challenge. Brain damage. So you have 47 seconds on the useless invention starting now. Actually, it appears to me that we are getting an awful lot of useless inventions. For instance, I've got some sort of mixer with endless attachments. For instance, a potato scraper and a bean slicer. Kenneth Williams. For instance, twice. Yes, Kenneth, you have 34 seconds for useless inventions starting now. Well, there aren't really useless any of them because there's always something someone can do with the odd implement. The only thing that can be said to be truly useless is that thing which fulfills no function at all. And, of course, there wouldn't be any instrument which could be described in those terms. No, even a uh, pen... Sheila, hang on, Instruments. Repeated instruments. Fourteen seconds left, Sheila, on useless inventions starting now. And I find these particular implements that I mentioned before I was rudely interrupted... Uh, Peter Jones, a the repetition of implements. Yes, I didn't say implements. Yes, you, you did. Say, you, did. Yeah. you said it before, yes. Yeah. 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 You just said you said it before. 
voice oh. with your own petards, you are. I didn't. <laughs> but you just said you said it before. You said those implements that I mentioned before. But I mentioned them in a different way before. No, you mentioned the word implement. All right. You said something about a, some implement that was attached to it that peeled a potato to while doing the washing up. I um, There are ten <laughs> seconds for useless inventions, Peter, starting now. Well, I do agree with Sheila that most of them seem to be situated in the kitchen. There are also a vast number of them attached... Uh, Sheila Hancock, challenge. No, I don't think most of them are situated in the kitchen. Well, that's your opinion as opposed to Peter's. He wasn't deviating he from the He said he agreed with me that most of them are situated in the kitchen. I never said that and I don't think that. That. Did you well, that, that was uh, that was uh, an informed guess on my <laughs> part. <laughs> uh, well, if you didn't say, then obviously he was deviating. So, um, Sheila, you have the subject of useless inventions with three seconds to go, starting now. You usually have to spend a great deal of time cleaning them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kenneth, your turn to begin, and the subject is three a.m. Oh dear. That's an offbeat subject, isn't it? Can you talk about it in just a minute, starting now? I was once told by Reverend Dominey that this was the hour at which the human body is at its lowest ebb. And so I should think it must be about 3 a.m. right now. On the other hand, <laughs> it can be if you're at some riotous gathering, a bacchanalian orgy, so to speak, which I said all of you crowd her off to at this Christmas period, <laughs> reading <laughs> about the street all that alcohol swishing around inside. Then 3 a.m. can be a period of enormous hypertension, where the mind is seething with ideas and suggestions as you nudge alongside a fellow guest and make a suggestion as to how you should pass um, the... Sheila Hancock has challenged. Suggestions. Yeah, too many suggestions going on at 3am in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... a pathetic nature of an orgy when nudging is the only... <laughs> <laughs> Just for a nudge. Come on. <laughs> Everything's got to begin somehow. Nudge. That could an alien nudge. I like that. <laughs> uh, Sheila Hancock, you have the subjects 3 a.m. and you have 15 seconds starting now. As a person who suffers occasionally from insomnia. <sighs> Uh, Kenneth Williams, it's chance. Insomnia, not insomnia, so therefore deviation. I didn't Oh, don't be ridiculous, Kenneth. Did you suffer from insomniacs? That's all right. She said insomnia, and she has ten seconds on 3 a.m. starting now. 3 a.m. is a particularly awful time of the night, particularly if you're lying next to somebody who is... Uh, Peter Jones. Well, particularly. Yes, I'm a particularly right, and there are five seconds for you on 3 a.m. starting now. Well, it's a rather nice hour. I think everyone is just waking up and going out. <laughs> well, the situation's very Night close. They're neck and neck. City. Sheila, Hancock, Peter Jones, and Kenneth Williams. William Rushton's trailing a little. And Sheila, up. your turn to begin. The subject uh. is flat feet. Uh. You sound if your arches have dropped. Yes, all of a they have. Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? I have suffered all my life from flat feet. When I was a very little girl, it was defined as the metatarsal arch, which instead of going upwards, went downwards. And I spent all my break picking daisies with my toes, which was supposed, according to the remedial teacher, to cure this said lump. However, it didn't, and I still crawl around after a day shopping, moaning in agony at these fallen flat feet, and it is a miserable existence. No cure can be found. It's no good sticking those little rubber things under your arch. <laughs> well, this is beyond the game. It's become a cry for help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the last minute you were describing your insomnia. Now you're on about your flat feet. <laughs> oh, I mean, we can't. Go on. This please a for a whole festive tide. Yeah. <laughs> well, how's your challenge anyway, Peter? Uh, oh, just depressing <laughs> the audience. Uh, this being un-Christmassy. I mean, who's in the lead at the moment? You're all very, very close. Sheila's just in the lead. Sheila's in the lead already. Yes, well, there you are. Well, what's and your challenge? 
Uh, uh, repetition of flat. Quite <laughs> true, but it's on the card. Oh, yes. Yes. yes, but you, you could have said, uh, which she did say, her fallen flat feet. And yes, I the, know. I didn't think it was nice that... to mention them. <laughs> yeah. It's the arches that fall, not the feet. Ah, yes. Uh, yes. Sheila, you've got to go on with your flat oh, feet. I'm afraid. How many minutes? I haven't had a correct challenge. There are 20, not minutes. 20? Seconds, not minutes. Oh, I must have been talking for longer than that. It no. seemed longer. <laughs> <laughs> seems eternal. Well, you were rather flat-footing it, but I if you know. give time and keep going, this will start now. <sighs> Despite my flat feet, I seem somehow to have struggled to the lead in this game, and I may be talking rather boringly and flat-footedly. However, I have endeavoured to surpass Willie Rushton, Peter Jones, and Kenneth Williams on my two little flat feet. Not so very small, actually. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Repetition of little. Yes. There are two seconds, Peter. The starting now. I suffered from them as a child, overcame it with willpower. <laughs> oh, dear. So at the oh. end of that round, Sheila Hancock is one ahead of Peter Jones, who's one ahead of Kenneth Williams, who's four ahead of William Rushton. And William, your turn to begin. Slang. Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Uh, being a Londoner, of course, the most popular form of slang is Cockney rhyming slang. Cockneys say such stupid things as I am... Uh, Kenneth Williams has chance. I played Cockney twice, wasn't I? I know, but he's only played the game once before, and give him a chance. Well, you speak for yourself. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> William, will you tell us something about slang with 53 seconds left, starting now? The inhabitants uh, of this great metropolis... I'm a great hesitation. I'm going to give it against you that time, Kenneth. Seconds must be left, um, right. 51 seconds, Kenneth, on slang starting now. This, of course, is when words become corrupted and take a form they did not have hitherto. As we have the original expression, God be with you, we now have goodbye, and the whole thing has become corrupted. Yet the slang has become orthodox. And very often, this happens in the language. It's... <laughs> Sheila, what was your challenge? Repetition of... <laughs> and it sounded just as what Sheila said, mumbling away. And I would miss... I just had a message. This is going to be the last subject. Uh -huh. And that's 32 seconds on slang, Sheila, starting now. A lot of people disapprove of slang, but despite that, I am one of the people that Kenneth talks about who think it adds flavour to a language. Little words like crikey and... Uh, uh, Kenneth Williams. Oh, it seems to be jabbering to a halt. So, hesitation? Yeah. Good, all right. So you have 19 seconds on slang, Kenneth, starting now. The slang which proceeds from the kind of thing that Miss Hancock was just discussing, and which I cannot, within the rules of this game, repeat, is a disgrace. And I shall not deal with it because I consider it a matter which is naturally indelicate with this charming and decorous <laughs> and... <laughs> Well, as I said a moment ago, we were reaching the end of the game, so now let me give you the final score. William Rushton, returning after only having played the game once before, finished in fourth place, a little way behind Peter Jones. And he was about three points behind Sheila Hancock and four behind this week's winner, Kenneth Williams. <laughs> have enjoyed listening to just a minute from all of us here. Goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd.
We present Derek Nimmo, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Amy MacDonald in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And uh, once again, as you've heard, we welcome back Eamon MacDonald as our guest to play with our three regular competitors. They're going to try and speak if they can, without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject that I will give them. And of course, they will score points or lose them accordingly. We'll begin the show this week with Peter Jones. And Peter, the subject is awards. Would you talk on that one for just a minute, starting now? Well, I always think of awards as those statuettes and other types of ornament which are given to actors for the best performance in various mediums annually. I don't altogether approve of this because, to me, art is not really competitive. However, I welcome the publicity. I've never been the recipient of one of these things, and it has seemed to me always that it would be slightly depressing to have been the best actor of, say, 1953 in this present year, because it does tend to sound as though one has not really done anything since then. But uh, no, doubtless, the other people who have been awarded these things, they go on working. I've been told by several friends that work has never come their way. I wonder why they're letting me repeat this. Is it some sort of... <laughs> 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 Derek Nimmo challenge. Repetition. <laughs> of what? Whatever, whatever you would like. <laughs> <laughs> I you actually helping out or something. But I you don't. actually, Peter, didn't repeat. You said working and work. Yeah. Did I really? So you didn't repeat. No, well, in that case, you better give it me back again. And I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Derek's got a bit bogged down. I was rather fed up with a rather well, boring subject. That was all. Derek's right. challenge was for repetition, and as you didn't repeat anything, I it's don't an think, incorrect I think challenge. I think you ought to know what I repeated. I don't think you can give it him if he doesn't even know. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well then. I'm <laughs> giving it to you. So you're not I'm, I'm not going to give it to him. I've said he's got a wrong challenge. That's a point to you for a wrong challenge. You ah, keep yes. the subject, there are four seconds My left. hearing's almost as bad as yours, you know. <laughs> My hearing's all right, except when you speak at the same time as I do. What did you say? <laughs> there are four seconds on awards, Peter, starting now. I'd like to have one of those bright red rosettes that they put on cart horses. So, Derek, uh, sorry, Peter Jones was speaking then when a whistle went, which Ian Messler blows for us after 60 seconds, and uh, therefore he gets the extra point, and at the end of the first round, he's the only one to have any points. Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the stocks. Can you tell us something about those in 60 seconds, starting now? The stocks in my garden, or oh, that's rather chilly, are surviving remarkably well this year. It's because I've put plastic sheeting over them to keep them well during the autumn and into the winter months. Also, I have seen in the countryside, near a particular cave that I favour, a beautiful pair of... A Kevin Freud challenge show. Hesitation. Yes, it was. There are 34 seconds on the stocks, Clement, starting now. One of the most notable fundraising activities at the moment, when there are garden fates, is for people who support your cause to have themselves put into the stocks, and anyone who goes there may purchase pies or buckets of water to throw at the gentlemen or ladies who have allowed themselves to be locked into the stocks. A great deal of fun is had by one and all, though... <coughs> Not by uh, me. Peter Jones has challenged. Well, that's not true because the person who's actually having the pies and water <laughs> thrown doesn't have any fun. Loves it. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's quite uh, masochism. I would quite agree with your challenge, Peter, so you have the subject. I said 37 when Clement started. It actually was 27. So there are now seven seconds left for you to talk on the stocks starting now. Near where I used to live and was born, there is a pair of stocks, Western in Shropshire, which you can see to this day. Real wood with the holes. Peter Jones was then speaking when the whistle went. He got that extra point and he's increased his lead at the end of that round. Clement Freud, your turn to begin the subject, beautiful soup. Would you talk to us about it for just a minute, if you can, starting now? Soup, beautiful soup, was a very well-known Victorian cry and is one that I never much cared for because as far as I'm concerned, 
soup should be palatable rather than beautiful. I can imagine the sort of concoction of liquidized watermelon dressed with sprigs of lilies, clover, which would be very beautiful, but I think absolutely appalling. Watercress, new potatoes, a few sprigs of mint, and the yellow liquor is fed into a liquidizer, which is put on speed number three, fastly raised to uh, four, Amy then child. five. Did you say liquor, darling? Did you put liquor in soup? You do call. Liquor is um, any liquid at all. It needn't be alcoholic. <laughs> Fish stock is liquor just as much as Benedictine. You learn something different every day, don't you? <laughs> Come back again, Amy. You, you mean never know what you, you might learn. ask me to dinner, and after dinner you say, would you like a drop of liquor? And then I say, yes, I would. You give me some fish stock. <laughs> <laughs> Seven seconds for beautiful soup, Clement, starting now. Haddock. <sighs> Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Oh, hesitate. I think so, Derek, yes. You have six seconds, no, five seconds on beautiful soup starting now. I once heard Gaylord Houser say that one should never build on a swamp, meaning that one should never start a meal with soup. <laughs> well, at the end of that round, Derek Nimmo was speaking when the whistle went, and so he gained that extra point. He's now equal with Clement Freud in second place. They're behind Peter Jones, who's still our leader, and Amy MacDonald, it's your turn to begin. What will happen this evening? Oh, Amy, <laughs> tell us something. Entertain us, titillate us. You have 60 seconds to do so, starting now. Actually, it's very exciting for me because I've never done this before. I'm reorganizing my bedroom. Very <laughs> 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 uh, Kevin and Freud, oh, that's, that's child. Oh, but I know I, I was Well, thinking. after that dirty laugh of yours, I'm not surprised you didn't hesitate. <laughs> Completely unfair. So, Amy, you, uh, you keep the subject still, and there are um, 47 seconds for what will happen this evening starting now. Well, you see, I've got hold of this wonderful fabric, and I'm doing everything in the same fabric. Oh, oh yes, I, I did it again. Yes. Uh, Two fabrics. Two fabrics. Out of her own uh, mouth, she uh, admitted her error, and there are 43 seconds, Clement, for what will happen this evening starting now. I'm very pleased about this subject, as... Uh, Peter Jones's challenge. There's nothing to do with it. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no uh, that's one point to me. I get the subject. Yes. <laughs> Peter Jones has got a point and he has the subject. And there are 36 seconds on what will happen this evening starting now. Well, I didn't include my crystal ball among those I brought with me today. So I'm not able to say with any great certainty what is actually going to happen. I um, would like Clement to... Freud. Deviation. Why? Even if he'd brought his crystal ball, he couldn't have said with any certainty what was going to happen. But he still is not deviating from the subject on the card. He still can't say with a crystal ball or not. He can't say with any certainty what's going to happen. So he's not deviating from the subject. What will happen this evening, um, Peter? You still have 23 seconds left starting now. If I could obtain a packet of tarot cards from the attendant or... Um, Amy MacDonald, child. Oh, he doesn't need all that to know what's happening this evening. No, he doesn't. They wouldn't tell him very no. much either. No. All right, Amy. You have uh, 17 seconds on what will happen this evening starting now. Well, you said making these wonderful... Oh, oh Derek I didn't do anything. A repetition of well, you see. Yeah. I always That's say well, you see. And the I know, if you always say, then it's repetition, isn't it? <laughs> Aren't they wicked, Amy? I'll be kind on this occasion. Don't say, well, you see it again. And keep the subject. And there are 15 seconds. I won't charge any points. Starting now. I am designing and making with my friend some little lamp shades. They are divided into two bits. <laughs> Derek Nimmo challenge. Hesitation before bits. Yes, isn't it rotten? Derek, you have the subject. There are seven seconds on what will happen this evening. Starting now. Well, you see what I'm doing this uh, evening. <laughs> Challenge. Uh, what's your challenge, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> but Amy, I know it's because he, well, he said, well, you see, but he yeah. hasn't said it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was you who said it. And if he takes over that, he can now repeat all that bit about lampshades if he wants to. Because he hasn't said it, you have. 
So there are five seconds, Derek, on what will happen this evening starting now. I'm heading straight round for Amy MacDonald's bedroom, and when I get there, I hope to find that all those bits of fabric have been put on top of the bed. Um, Derek, you were speaking then when the whistle went. You get an extra point for that. You've moved into second place, one behind Peter Jones, two ahead of Clement Freud, and Amy McDonald's in fourth place. And Peter Jones, your turn to begin. Then the subject is type casting. <clears throat> Can you talk on that for just a minute, starting now? Well, on the occasional nights when I suffer from insomnia, I don't <laughs> count sheep. I recast the world. And the idea is that I change people round and give successful uh, persons from... Amy McDonald has challenged. Uh, oh, 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 that was going on. <laughs> what are you challenging for? Well, well you're uh, doing a I mean, mocking, a and cruel please. caricature of what I was doing. I merely hesitated in all good faith. I didn't make that jerky movement and those dreadful noises. I think it's very unkind of you, Amy, Just after all I've done for you in the past. <laughs> Just a minute, darling. I wasn't just doing hesitation, you see. I was going to go on a bit. No, but he was also... hesitating. And but... he was also deviating, darling. No, so it doesn't talk... matter. One challenge is quite enough, Amy. And after all, no, he, he, he was hurt. He was very hurt about that impersonation of yours. She presents a good case, doesn't she? Ah, but you have the subject, because he was hesitating, and there are 45 seconds on typecasting starting now. Thank you very much. Peter, you see, was talking actually about recasting, which is quite different. If you're typecasting, it means you're putting a face to something that is peculiar to that face. Uh, Emma two Freud faces. Challenged. Two faces. There were two faces, yes, very peculiar. Um, 32 <laughs> seconds on typecasting. I do try, you... honestly. I really am trying. <laughs> no, you're not a bit trying, Amy. It's lovely to have you here. <laughs> And you work very hard on the programme. Uh, 32 seconds on typecasting, Clement, starting now. I suppose the typical instance of typecasting was when they were making the Derek Nimmo story and actors from all over auditioned for the leading part, which was finally given to the man sitting opposite me eating sandwiches out of the bag. <laughs> I have myself played Clement Freud in a number of films and was permanently surprised to see when the characters appeared on the screen afterwards that the name which I had been awarded on the titles was some way from my actual nomenclature. <laughs> Derek, your turn to begin the subject, booze. Would you talk to us on that one for just a minute, starting now? Well, of all the booze that I've come across, my favourite is, of course, Evelyn Lay. Boo to her friends was the title of her autobiography. What a dear, gracious, talented lady she is. And I had the great pleasure of performing with her for many months in a play called The Amorous Prawn, which is one of the formative periods of my life. And dear booze. Uh, Clement Freud. Repetition of dear. Yeah. <coughs> Yes, you're right, Clement. You have the subject. You have 36 seconds on booze starting now. Of all the most beautiful booze, fish liquor is the one that I cannot <laughs> Derek recommend. Derek Nemo's challenge. I'm sorry. <coughs> booze must have an alcoholic content in their connotation. <laughs> I agree. Uh, Derek, 31 what seconds do you mean you on agree? with Derek Nemo. My fish liquor was laced. <laughs> when you were talking about it before, you never included the alcohol. I wasn't talking about it before. It's a different you. fish liquor. You um, all right, I'm going to put it to the audience. If you consider that uh, Clement Freud's fish liquor has got booze in it, and therefore uh, Derek Nimmo's challenge is unjustified, you then boo for Clement. And if you think Derek Nimmo's challenge was justified, you cheer for him, and please all do it together now. <laughs> Your fish liquor hasn't got booze in it. They know. <laughs> Derek, you have the subject. There are 31 seconds on booze starting now. Here's to the pretty young maid of 15. There's to the widow of 50. As you get hold of a great flagon of ale and pour it down your throat. How thirst-quenching. What's the matter? Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> Amy McDonald. What are you all about again? Now he got so carried away, he said throast. <laughs> he didn't say throat. That's I said throat. You said throast, didn't he? 
Yes. Mm. Did he? I don't know. Well, knows. I couldn't hear from him. He was going so fast. Do you think he said froze? All right, Amy, you have the subject. There are 22 seconds on boo starting now. I like champagne, of course. Other things don't agree with me. For instance, if I drink scotch, I feel a bit peculiar. Vodka I can get away with for a short time. Oh, Terry Nimmo's challenge. Hesitation. Hesitation. <laughs> yes, yes. She hiccuped. Yes. <laughs> you want to know how to get Amy Peculiar, give us some whiskey. Right. There are nine seconds on booze with you, Derek, starting now. When I sit by myself on a lonely winter evening, I look longingly towards the cabinet which encloses my 12-year-old whiskey. I furtively glance... <laughs> Well, Derek Nemo speaking when the whistle went, got another point, and he's now taken the lead at the end of that round. Clement Freud, your turn to begin the subject, Concord. Would you talk to us about the subject uh, for just a minute, if you can, starting now? The post office tower is situated in Euston, actually at the bottom of Charlotte Street, and gives you an unprecedented view of London by virtue of a restaurant on the top floor which circulates. It's really very interesting... <laughs> Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Very, very interesting repetition. Yes, it was. And there are it's really, very, very, really, very interesting. Very, very interesting. No, I never, ever say. I really say. <laughs> I've never said very, very anything because my R's, I don't pronounce them very well. So I, it's well, a I word I avoid. Well, I thought you said very, very, I don't know. It's really very interesting. Well, I wasn't sure, but I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt, Clement, and saying you have 44 seconds on Concord starting now. Concorde is an aeroplane. I was amazed not to have been challenged when I talked for such a long time about the building in London. It was quite interesting when Concorde was first named. Uh, Derek Nimmo, challenge. Repetition of interesting. Yes, yes that is correct on this That's occasion. There are right. 25 seconds on Concorde, Derek, starting now. The author of Peace and Lover of Concorde, a knowledge of whom strength are eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, which is the second prayer in Anglican matins. And I think that really shows to the world, and has done for many centuries, what the concord we would like to achieve between nations is rarely about. If one reads the prayer book, I can think one can often find things which today have particular interest. Uh, Derek, you've increased your lead at the end of that round, but Amy, it is your turn to begin, and the subject that Ian Messard has thought of for you is draws. <laughs> you tell us something about that subject in 60 seconds, and you start now. I don't have draws, actually. I, <laughs> I go in more for briefs, you see. And you can buy those anywhere. You get very different sorts of those. Uh, Clement Freud. Repetition of those. Yes. Clement, you have 47 seconds on drawers starting now. Drawers such as young ladies wear or not, depending on their inclination, is what I propose now to speak about. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, are made of taffeta, silk, <laughs> nylon... Uh, Amy McDonald's challenge. I've never seen a pair of taffeta drawers. <laughs> <laughs> well, bad luck you. <laughs> They all be scratchy, darling. You couldn't wear taffeta drawers. You couldn't wear them on the radio because they'd be very noisy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all that rustling. Yes, exactly. They wear taffeta petticoats, they're not drawers. Hmm. Clement, do you have um, 14 seconds on drawers for Giving starting it to now? Him, darling. A pastel shade of orange and pink. Perhaps. <sighs> Uh, Derek Nimmo, child. I have a pastel shade of orange and pink. No, orange would hardly be pastel, would oh, it? I've had orange pastels for years. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. Oh, get mm, round back to your tree. Um, Eleven seconds on draws with you, Derek, starting now. I think, of course, of football pools and what fun they are to go in for. It gives one everlasting hope, doesn't it? During the winter months, you get the forms, you put in your crosses, and you try to choose the draws which you hope will come up, and then you'll have great fortune. Uh, at the end of that round, uh, Derek Nimmo got some more points. He's still just ahead of Clement Freud who is a few points ahead of Peter Jones, and he's now going to begin the next round. Peter, the subject is zero. 
Can you tell us something about that in 60 seconds, starting now? Well, it's a very negative subject <laughs> to talk about, I must say. I always think of it as being the very end of everything, like the last letter of the alphabet is the one with which the word begins, and it does signal a certain temperature which is, although not the extreme lowest that can be achieved, is nevertheless very, very cold. <laughs> Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge first. Five berries altogether, actually. Yeah, well, there was only there was two together there, beginning. very, very cold. There, Derek, you have the subject and you have 32 seconds on zero starting now. I have a dear old chum called Zero Mostel, who's an American actor of great talent, who played the lead in the original production on Broadway of Fiddler on the Roof. And I don't know whether the audience saw him in it, but it was, I think, perhaps the definitive performance of that particular part. And I remember going to the third night to see him at this theatre, and the audience stood and applauded applauded and cheered, and I'm not exaggerating, for at least seven and a half minutes after the show had terminated. What an exciting night I had that day on Manhattan Island. Uh, uh, Clement Freud. Repetition of night and day. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> night and night. So that day, actually, at the end. Yes, I know, but you'd said night before. Well, you didn't. Cole you Porter did. wasn't even the subject. Uh, <laughs> there are two seconds uh, with you, Clement, having got a correct challenge on zero starting now. The boys all call him Johnny. <laughs> so we have an interesting situation now because we can't have a lot of more time to go that Clement Freud is now only two points behind Derek Nimmo and uh, Peter Jones and Amy are both trailing a little and Clement your turn to begin the subject cherries would you tell us something about that delicious fruit or anything else which applies to the word starting now cherries is a delicious fruit or anything else that you care to think of, which comes mostly from Kent and is dark red or lighter pink, almost with an orange pastel glow about it. <laughs> and of all the sweetmeats that I most enjoy is a fudge made of black cherries from Switzerland. Sugar, treacle, syrup and molasses are melted in a heavy cast iron or aluminium saucepan on a medium flame with condensed milk and when it's poured out after having reached the temperature of 286 degrees Fahrenheit into a greased mold the cherries are added and the confection has a delicacy of texture an appeal a sweet Eamon MacDonald has challenged Oh, he's been going on there far too long. <laughs> <laughs> but he hasn't deviated, hesitated, or repeated anything. It was a bit boring, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I can't feel like... You can be as boring as you like in this game, but as long as you keep going and not commit any of those three penalties, uh, uh, it doesn't matter, you see, so he gets You'll a... certainly repeat often enough when he eats the fudge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he'll get very much of milk. You'll only get a little bit of that down you, it'll come straight back. I quite agree. Uh, seven seconds to continue on cherries, Clement, starting now. Cherry pips are exceedingly useless when you look for careers. Tinker, tailor, soldier, sailor. In fact, officers in... Well, alas, we have no more time to play just a minute. Let me give you the final score in this game. Amy MacDonald, coming back after her previous triumphs, finished in fourth place. She contributed a great deal, but didn't get a lot of points. Peter Jones uh, started off with a flourish, but he uh, petered out a little, forgive the pun, and finished in third place, a few points behind. Our equal winners this week, Derek Nimmo and Clement Freud. So we hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd.
present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Alfred Marx in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've heard, we have our three regulars, Clement Freud, Kenneth Williams and uh, uh, Peter Jones. And we welcome back to, after a few weeks' absence, uh, Alfred Marx. And... Uh, I'm going to ask them to speak on some subject without hesitation, without repetition, without deviation, if they can, or at least keep going until they're challenged. And we're going to begin the show this week with Clement Freud, and the subject, Clement, is the Parisian Latin Quarter. Would you talk about that for just a minute, if you can, starting now? Well, I'm very pleased to talk about the Parisian Latin Quarter, because the Latin Quarter in Tunbridge Wells, or that in Wigan, <laughs> would be a very much more difficult subject. In the Parisian Latin Quarter, you see people... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. Why does he keep saying Parisian? Because he did. Why shouldn't he? Because you did. Yes. Oh, is that is the wrong pronunciation, is oh, it? Oh, yes. Oh, so you were sending him up? No. Oh, I see. Well, what would you say? Parisian. All right, then. Would you talk, please, now, Clement Freud, for another 46 seconds on the Parisian Latin Quarter starting now? It's full of people like Alfred Marx who wear the same clothes from one week to several times later. And Hunchbacks... Um, Alfred Marx, a challenge. I'll tell you, repetition, deviation, those were also libelous. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in that suit for weeks and don't deny it. Put it to the audience. But no, no, no. Was he or was, was he not? Lady, would you please judge? When Alfred Marx was here last time, would you please, if he was wearing the same clothes, you think he was wearing the same clothes, would you please cheer for him? And if you think he was wearing different clothes, would you please boo for him? And we all do it together now. Hooray! I think it was a draw. I don't think they have any idea what you were wearing, but it was I'm a draw. sure. The, the drawers are the only thing I'm wearing. <laughs> That's where he's got us. We don't know what he's wearing underneath, which may be different. So, uh, Alfred, you have a, uh, a challenge which is correct, and so you get a point for that, and you take over the subject of the Parisian Latin Quarter. There are 37 seconds left, starting now. Paris is a most beautiful city, one of the loveliest in Europe, and one of the nicest areas of this city is the art the ah, or of the repetition of city yes there was more than one city there but well, having be... not gained that point i can tell you now i am wearing the same clothes i wore them <laughs> <laughs> oh god the release the relief at home with all those people hanging on their sets about alfred's underclothes and worried about it <laughs> Now we can get on with the game. Uh, Clement's got an extra point for correct challenge. He has 30 seconds left on the Parisian Latin Quarter starting now. What worries most visitors to the Latin Quarter is where are the other 75%? Because quarter means that elsewhere would be a half and yet another quarter. People have gone all over the capital of France. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Repetition of people. Yes, the people were worried before, and the people going over the, the whole of France. There were different people. <laughs> <laughs> there may be, but you repeated the word, which ah. you can't do in just a minute. I and see. there are now 13 seconds for Peter Jones to talk about the Parisian Latin Quarter, starting now. Well, it's really a kind of French Soho, and uh, very cheap to live there. I stayed for a few days in a very uh, sleazy hotel and was actually burgled in the middle of the night. A man opened the door and went through the back. I'd have thought, Peter, if you were burgled in the middle of the night, it would have made it very expensive. Um, <laughs> yes. Peter Jones was then speaking when the whistle well, went. Well, I didn't so have he... much to steal because I was wearing the same clothes all the way through. <laughs> anyway, Peter Jones was speaking when the whistle went, so he got the extra point. He's in second place now behind Clement Freud. Oh, that was the first subject, wasn't it? So at the end of the first round... At the end of the first round, Clement Freud has a lead of one over Peter Jones, who has a lead of one over Alfred Marx, who has a lead of one over Kenneth Williams, who has yet to speak, as far as I can remember. So, Kenneth, will you start talking now? The subject is cherubs. Can you talk on those for 60 seconds, starting now? Well, in mythology, the rules accompanied by seraphs, and the plural is cherubim and seraphim, and they were attendant on the right hand. 
And Peter Jones. Must be hesitation. It must be right. <laughs> there are 46 seconds on Cherubs with you, Peter, starting now. Well, they're rather boring, I always think. Uh, Kenneth Williams is Not start. boring at all. They're delightful. The chubby faces as painted by Titian on those incredible ceilings in the Palazzo in Venice are only... Uh, Kenneth... Why don't you save it in case you get in a game with the correct challenge? Because that was a wrong challenge. I'm challenging now. It's deviation. No, I disagree. They're not boring. Peter, you didn't deviate from the subject of cherubs, whatever you may say about them. So you have 44 seconds to continue with uh, one point for an incorrect challenge, and you start now. To me, they always appear to be overweight and obese. These great cheeks, you know, jowls and great fat uh, bottoms and knees. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Fat er. Uh. Hesitation. Yeah, there's uh, a hesitation. Mm. There are two greats as well which you missed. There are 35 seconds on cherubs starting now. These beautiful creatures, which have been the inspiration for artists, especially during the Renaissance period of modern Europe. Uh, Peter Jones. Some kind of hesitation there. No, I don't think he hesitated. No, he keeps the subject after an incorrect challenge. And there are 27 seconds on cherubs, Kenneth, starting now. A source of continual delight, not only on canvases, but blowing from those rows cheeks, the various winds which were pictured on the old illustrative maps for navigators, so that it went to north, east, south, or west, as the little cherub blew. I thought. <laughs> I, 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 I ran out. You did it? Oh. I thought you saw um, Ian Messer put his whistle in his mouth and you thought, well, this is it. Oh, was it nearly there? Yes. Oh, what a shame. What a Only... rotten shame, isn't it? Two and a half seconds to go, that was all, and Clement uh, Freud challenged. Did he? Yes. Oh, well, he gets it then. All right, so hesitation, two and a half seconds, Clement Cherub starting now. I had a gomphotic schoolmaster who... <laughs> Well, you had two opinions there about cherubs, and Kenneth Williams got some points, so did Peter Jones. Alfred Marks, it's your turn to begin. The subject is croquet. Can you talk about uh, that game for just a minute, starting now? What a lot of balls have gone through hoops <laughs> on an English lawn in the summertime. If Tennyson didn't say that, he should have done, because what a wonderful scene to hear the click of hammer upon the wooden spheres on a beautiful day in the countryside. A game that's so peculiarly English, and yet I don't suppose it is. It probably um, um, is. Uh, sorry, Peter Jones. A repetition of English. I don't remember saying English before. Oh, I thought he said English at the fairly early, very beginning, really. No. English summer day, he said. Oh, I think you yes, did. Yes, I, I think I did. I think you did. English yes, well done, English Peter. Summer day, yes. 42 seconds with you, Peter Jones, on croquet starting now. Well, it's a wonderful spectator sport because there's very little hooliganism at uh, these games because the people are usually too old to actually do very much except uh, hold the mallets very gently and just push the balls through these tiny hoops. I understand that there is some kind of uh, crookery goes on among the players who are transferred from one team to another at modest sum, for modest amounts, um, like three pounds. Clement Freud. A repetition of modest. Yes, you were too modest. Yes. Mm. Uh, Clement Freud, you have a correct challenge. You have the subject of croquet. You have 12, no, 11 seconds starting now. E.P.C. Cotter, who incidentally taught me Latin at school, was once the croquet champion of Great Britain. A pleasant, plump... <laughs> Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. <laughs> uh, the subject is carpentry, Peter, and there were 60 seconds starting now. I was talking to someone the other day and they said they were a great start-it-yourself enthusiast, which is not the same as the do-it people, because uh, usually the people get tired. Um, Kenneth Williams. Because, uh, I'm afraid it was a... Yes, 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 I'm afraid so. There are 48 seconds for carpentry with you, Kenneth Williams, starting now. Well, I was watching the man saw this door, and I noticed that he raised wood to his nose, and I said, here, what on earth are you up to? And he said, have a smell of this yourself. It's marvellous, the flavour of this um, wood. The savour, the flavour. Well, I mean, the savour <laughs> of Peter Jones. Because um, it was actually um, pine, you um, see. Wood. And pine has the most marvellous flavour when oh, you saw right yes. through it. 
Very it's nice. about flavour or smell. It's smell. It's fabulous. Oh, the smell of any uh, yeah. newly covered. Yes. It's beautiful. Ooh. One of the most exotic smells. I'm yes. mad about it. Smell of pine and eggs. There are 30 seconds for Peter Jones, after that little um, uh, di diversion, to talk on the subject of carpentry, because he had a correct challenge a little while ago, uh, starting now. Well, you have to have a bench with a vice on it and a plane, saws, chisels, hammers, and the idea is to get a piece of wood of one shape and attach it to another of a dissimilar type. And in some way, either with a dovetail joint or glue, screw or nails even can be used for this purpose to make a table or some modest thing in a house, like a chair or a window. And if you can contrive... <laughs> That was very funny. He said some modest thing at the house, a chair or a window. Have you ever tried making a window? It's very complicated. Yes, I know, but it can be done. I'll explain if you like. But not modest. <laughs> I've done it. That's why I know it's not a modest well, thing. Well, you're not very modest. <laughs> Peter Jones, you kept going, they didn't challenge you, you got a point for speaking when the whistle went, and you've taken the lead at the end of that round. It's uh, Clement Freud's turn to begin, and the subject is muffins. Would you talk on that one, Clement, for just a minute, starting now? Muffins was the name colloquially given to the muffin men who roamed the streets in the 19th century, forcing people against their will to join the army or the navy. And generally, the citizens of towns and cities in this country were terrified late at night and seldom kept their doors open <laughs> Uh, Kenneth Williams. This is a load of rubbish. <laughs> These men sold muffins. They didn't press. They weren't press gang men at oh, all. Oh, press gang. That's the word I press was Press gang. Is that right? These players will simply it's sell it. It's an interesting thing about just Go a minute. Down that very nice keep yes. going. That if you keep going with enough confidence yeah, and style, right. I mean, I mean they don't always gang. challenge you. <laughs> no. But now the subject is muffins, so Kenneth has a correct challenge, and there are 37 seconds. He kept going quite deviously for, for 22 seconds without being challenged. Muffins, Kenneth, starting now. Alas, this delightful 18th century dish, the buttered muffin has not survived in the way that the crumpet has. <laughs> and in my youth, I recall gentlemen ringing a bell and joyfully Alfred. crying, Muffins! And Alfred is challenged. Why? How dare you? You're a guest on this program. You have the audacity to challenge an old age resident. <laughs> I'm just uh, curious to know how he knew so much about Crumpet in his youth. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> all right, give uh, Alfred a, a point for a good challenge. But he's, uh, Kenneth wasn't deviating. He keeps the subject. And there are 23 seconds left, Kenneth, starting now. The muffin was square as opposed to the crumpet, which was round, and always perforated in this tiny, minuscule fashion. So the butter became saturated. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Hesitation. The butter became saturated. <laughs> You're trying to do impersonations of me, mate. <laughs> no, 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 you there do is them a so point. well yourself. Well, Peter, you have nine seconds on muffins starting now. It's one of the principal ingredients of a favourite dish called Eggs Benedict. Now, you have to add eggs, and I think it's... Um, Alfred Marks. Repetition of eggs. Yes, he got in very cleverly as a newcomer with one second to go, and the subject is muffins, Alfred, starting now. As someone who... <laughs> Kenneth, your turn to begin. The subject, Hannibal. Would you talk about him for just a minute, if you can, starting now? I would prefer to discuss someone civilised, but since it's a barbarian, Hannibal came from Carthage, which, of course, we would now call North Africa, and did cause a tremendous amount of trouble to the civilised community. We would now call the Rip publican kind of Rome. And over the Alps, of course, he went as legend. Ha uh, Peter Jones. Repetition of of course. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. And, um, Peter, you have 32 seconds on Hannibal starting now. Yes, well, he had this famous journey over the Alps 
with these elephants. I'm never too sure how he managed to get them up the sides without the aid of ropes and so on. He may have had them. Who is to know? And there was a film, I understand, about this extraordinary feat some uh, years ago. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Sam Err. Yes, all right, Kenneth. Station. Twelve seconds on Hannibal, starting now. The rulers of Republican Rome, the period, were... Um, Clement Freud. Repetition of Rome. Yes, and Sorry. Republican Rome, too. There are nine seconds on Hannibal, starting now. If you eat other people and can't pronounce your C's, you could very easily be called a Hannibal. <laughs> Clement Freud has taken the lead, one ahead of Peter Jones at the end of the round, and we move to Alfred Marx to start the next round. Alfred, a nice one for you. A funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio. Would you talk on it, about it, or take it as your subject for 60 seconds, starting now? Oh, how many comedians have started their act with a funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio. In fact, very rarely does anything funny happen to anyone on the way to the studio, except today. <laughs> a man stopped me in the street and said to me, pardon me, would you give me two shillings for a bite to eat? And I said, uh, Kenneth, if he said to you today two shillings when we've gone over to the metric system, I find this very odd. He was a very odd man. Well, it's... Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean the metric, I meant the decimal. 43 seconds for you, Alfred, after an incorrect challenge to continue on. A funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio, starting now. A funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio last week, in fact. This was another man who came up to me and said, <laughs> Would you give me a shilling for a cup of coffee? And I said, A coffee's only thrown. He said, Yes, but I like to tip big. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Jones, you challenged. A repetition of shilling. So, 30 seconds with Peter Jones on the subject starting now. Yes, I can remember getting on a bus and producing a pound note, and there was some fuss about the change. They didn't seem to have any, and I think, well, London Transport has got all these hundreds of thousands uh, of buses. Alfred Marx. Well, I would dearly love to know what this has to do with the funny thing happening on yes, the way to the Yes, you didn't establish, Peter, and you were going for uh, nearly 13 seconds without... I think he was on the way to tell another lousy joke like I mine. <laughs> <laughs> I established that I was on a bus. You must admit that. Yes, but it was a 49 bus, which goes nowhere near the studio. <laughs> I didn't mention No, I number. don't think you established, Peter, uh, in the uh, time that you were talking, that you were uh, in the close to the subject, so Alfred has a correct challenge and he has uh, 13 seconds on a funny thing happened on the way to the studio starting now. Leaving the studio after a funny thing happened on the way to it, I met Peter Jones on the bus. And Peter said to me, can you lend me a shilling? Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. A repetition of Peter. Yes. 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 So, Peter, I should have said 18 seconds before because there are now 10 left for Peter on the subject starting now. Well, I would like to establish that this particular boring bus was on its way to the studio uh, and I was Clement aboard. Freud has challenged. Is this a private game or can anyone join <laughs> in? You can join in. They both seem to have said bus at least yes, 10 times. <laughs> and so, Clement, you... Can I give it to my friend Kenneth Williams because I, I really... Uh, you're passing you out time. Oh, he, never right. he doesn't want to travel by bus, you see. <laughs> Kenneth, you have five seconds on a funny thing happened to my way to the studio starting now. Well, it did happen. This lady said to me, I can do singing in the rain, but I'm not going to. And I said, why? She said, because it's not raining. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you got the point for speaking when the whistle went. You have moved forward. You've overtaken Alfred Marx and Peter Jones. Your turn to begin. Subject, parsnips. <laughs> can you talk about them for 60 seconds, starting now? I can remember so well seeing these vegetables in huge marquees at agricultural and horticultural shows. Long, two or three feet in length, some of them, with a very thin, hairy extremity and the top all fleshy and yellowy sort of uh, creamy Clement colour. Freud has challenged. Deviation. Why, yes. He's talking about carrots. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Not fleshy. I could never describe any parsley but fleshy. Really? It's hard and solid and firm and upright and noble. It was my nickname at school. <laughs> uh, parsnips with you, Clement, starting now. 
When I decided not to marry Gladys, after all... What was the challenge, actually? Deviation. We were called just two parsnips who passed in the night. And that is very much how I like to think of her, lying there in Wolverhampton, miserably sad, waiting for the University Grants Commission to send more money and help both of us to live a better life than we had any right to expect. But if you boil them for not very long, having scraped them previously, and mash them with butter, and pile them onto a toasted muffin, then there can be no more delicious savoury to brighten your evening... Boiled parsnips on a toasted muffin. <laughs> and, um, Alfred Marx, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is My Goldfish. Can you tell us something about him in 60 seconds, starting now? My goldfish are buried in my garden because I've had no luck with this particular type of pet. I have snails, I have tortoise, I even have crabs, but I have never had any luck whatsoever with the goldfish. We keep them in a bowl, we feed them steak, chips, eggs, <laughs> all sorts of ambrosia. Nothing seems to work. In the morning, there they are, floating on their side, helpless, and how nice they would be with a plate of fried potatoes, however. <laughs> Peter Jones has challenged. Well, I think he'll be in trouble with the RSPCA for cruelty to goldfish mm. if he's giving them well, egg so and chips. Well, so what is your challenge? Uh, deviation, deviation and... Uh... No, he wasn't deviating, but he did repeat himself, which you overlook, so Alfred right. keeps the subject and he has a point for an incorrect challenge and there are 33 seconds left starting now. My children are heartbroken each time one of these poor little fish die because they dearly love... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Die. He repeated the word die. Yes, 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 yes. And, Peter, you have a correct challenge there. You now have 27 seconds to talk on my goldfish starting now. Well, my goldfish also passed on or was called before or whatever it is that you <laughs> happens to goldfish when they haven't been fed right or the cat gets uh, at Williams them. Kenneth Williams has challenged. It's a dreary this funeral recital of these deaths of all these fish. I think it's dreary. It might be dreary, but it's dreary. Not... Dreariness is uh, no objection in this game, no, as I well said... you know. In fact, <laughs> you probably know better than anybody. Well, I haven't said anything for ages, and I feel I'm just getting trampled on and left out of things. I know, but you look quite pretty sitting <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> now, let Very me nice. uh, continue nice. with this saga of the goldfish. Well, you made your point. I quite agree with what you just said, Peter. I'm going to say much. much the same. And you have, um, 17 seconds to continue on my goldfish starting now. I always wanted a much larger aquarium because this round uh, thing that it was in wasn't really large enough and did, in fact, cause a fire hazard because the magnification of the sun's rays through the bowl beside the goldfish was often... <laughs> Well, there was Peter struggling gamefully through to the end and uh, a little uh, uh, generosity on the part of the others let him finish with the whistle. He got an extra point for doing so and now I will give you the final situation because we have no more time. Uh, Kenneth came only just in fourth place, only one point behind Alfred Marx who returned to do extremely well against these three tough competitors. He came only three points behind Clement Freud but Clement Freud this time finished up two points behind this week's winner with that last flourish, Peter Jones. <laughs> We hope you have enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd.
We present Kenneth Williams, Derek Nemo, Clement Freud and Alfred Marx in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've heard, we're delighted to welcome back Alfred Marx, who did so well a few weeks ago, to come and do battle again with our three stalwart and intrepid players of the game. We're going to begin the show this week with Derek Nimmo, and as usual, they're all going to try and speak if they can for just a minute on some subject that I'll give them without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject. Derek, the subject to begin the show is putting one over. Could you talk to us on that one? 60 seconds, starting now. It is really quite difficult to put one over, I suppose. I have tried occasionally, particularly during the Lenten season. But then I have discovered, as the years have gone by, that I am getting a little too elderly for this particular pursuit. Sometimes, though, when the sun is in the sky, I rise with new confidence. And Clement Freud is challenged. Deviation. Why? The sun is always in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> a very you very not always challenge. see it, though, can you? That's right. No, no. Uh, uh, Clement, I agree with your challenge, so you gain a point for that, and you take over the subject. And you have 37 seconds on putting one over starting now. There's a lot of putting one over in this country, which is known as putting one under in Australia and New Zealand, <laughs> because being on the other side of the globe, it is a geographical as well as geometrical phenomenon that the overputting cannot be consistent in all parts of the world. Maudie Littlehampton, whom Sir Osbert Lancaster epitomized and drew so very beautifully in the Beaverbrook Press, has on many occasions excelled himself by... Well, the whistle which Ian Methoda blows for us tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever speaking at that moment gains an extra point. It was, of course, Clement Freud on this occasion, so he's anyone to get any points at all in that round. Alfred Marx, will you begin the next round? The subject, the fright of my life. Can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Walking up the aisle at my wedding, I <laughs> turned to my bride-to-be, looked at her askance, screamed and said, Darling, behind you are five of my old girlfriends. A fright, I think, no one of any... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Is it age? Yes, I'm afraid so. He had an awful fright, didn't he? Uh, Have the... you seen my wife? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't wonder that I hesitated. And You're full of fright at the moment. 44 seconds for you, Derek, on the fright of my life starting now. The fright of my life occurred when I was in Victoria and Australia and travelling from Bendigo to Ballarat. I happened to be following behind Wilkie's Circus and the circus stopped at the light... And, and Clement Freud has challenged. Uh, to Sir Kai. <laughs> and what happened when they stopped the lights then? All the monkeys got out oh, at the <laughs> top of the bridge. Uh, there are 32 seconds, Clement, on the fright of my life starting now. I think the fright of my life occurred when I came to this program and saw yet again Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> that chairman whom I thought after several weeks ago, we had got rid of. It had been tacitly agreed among the people here that he was elderly and incompetent. And yet, I entered the studio and there he was. The fright of my life. And if you would like... Well, this is the fright of Clement Freud's life telling you that uh, at the end of that round... He's he was disqualified. The... <laughs> <laughs> he was our uh, fair, that he was speaking when the whistle went, and old as I am, I can still read what Ian Mess has written down. He's got a good lead at the end of that round. Uh, Derek, Nimmo, your turn to begin. The subject, clocks. Would you tell us something about those in 60 seconds, starting now? The very first kind of clock to be recorded was the clepsindron, which was invented in ancient Egypt and was formed by a stone bowl with a hole in it through which water slowly dripped. Things have improved since then, and we've used sand. Of course, sundars were very popular, and sometimes if you travel in the southern hemisphere, you find these particular kind of clocks. 
books, which are set to a period before Greenwich Mean Time, and therefore they don't record in any kind of accuracy that hour which is now taking place. Also, one thinks of Tompion, the great clockmaker of England, who produced such wonderful works of art that one can see in the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Wallace Collection, and throughout the, all the galleries of the world. One of these great <laughs> masterpieces. <laughs> Well, this week they're really showing their paces. Last time Alfred Marx was here, they hardly got going at all. But this week, they're, nothing's holding them back. So Derek started with the subject, finished with the subject. So he got two points for that. And he is one point behind our leader, Clement Freud. Clement, it's your turn to begin the subject, Wedding Photographers. And there are 60 seconds, and you start now. I'm awfully pleased to be given the subject of wedding photographers because wedding photographs is something which I speak about at great length and have in recent times actually done, whereas photographers are... Oh, more Derek, there's chance. Yes, there was, because he dried up on the photographers. Dry up, there are 45 yes. seconds, Derek, for you to go on wedding photographers starting now. I don't like seeing wedding photographers crawling down the aisle of the church, which they seem to do with increasing frequency these days, to take snaps from interesting angles beneath the bride's bouquet. I think they should be kept firmly outside the eglise, and there I take their snaps when the happy party come outside. Uh, Alfred Marks has chucked. Repetition of snaps. Yes, there were too much snapping going on there. <laughs> there are 26 seconds, Alfred, for you on wedding photographers starting now. My dear grandmother, who's long deceased, went to wedding photographers in our locality and said, I have here... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. I'm sure on his grandmother's day, there have been portrait painters. <laughs> <laughs> what a horribly rude There's no challenge. need to be so nasty. <laughs> you really are a very nasty person, Nimmo. You may have lovely toes, but you've got a mean mind. <laughs> And while you can be rude to the chairman, and I don't do much about it, I can at least offend the other contestants, especially when they're a guest and they don't come regularly. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Twenty seconds and a point for a wrong challenge, and wedding photographers starting now. She presented this photograph of my dead grandfather and said, this is very old-fashioned, could you do something about it? And he said, yes, we have a retouch artist. And she said, what I want you to do is to remove the hat. He said, fine. And then she said, could you please erase the moustache? He said, yes. And then she said, could you alter the colour to make it more modern? He said, yes. And the photographer said, when I remove the, the uh, covering for the head, which side does he part his hair? She said, you'll see that when you take his hat off. <laughs> yes, Alfred paused then because he thought someone had challenged him, which was actually incorrect. You're in second place behind our equal leaders, Derek Demmer and Clement Freud. Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. Lady Hamilton. And there are 60 seconds, and you start now. Well, she wasn't a very recommendable person, not in my point of view, anyway. And there were several liaisons long before the husband, whose title she took, came along. And apparently there was this sort of conniving threesome with her and Nelson and this old man she got in tow with. And it all seems to me to be reprehensible, to say the least. He was a Greek antiquary, though and went around looking at these Corinthian marbles as they were known and apparently enlightened quite a few as to their authenticity and she bore this child or infant as you might put it depending on your proclivities to the aforementioned Horatio what's it and, of course, a lot of people maintain that during her stay in Naples... I suppose if you have to keep going when there's a threat of a challenge coming from three keen people, you can call a Nelson Horatio what's it? So, Kenneth, you started with the subject and you finished, so you got a point for speaking the whistle went, and you got two points for that, and you're still in fourth place. 
Alf remarks, your turn to begin. The subject, discovery. Can you talk to us on that for 60 seconds, starting now? The discovery I've made since I've been a guest on this show is either to shut up if you have nothing to say, save it up for the time when you can really get in with a sharp one, because you're surrounded by such people who have such vast experience. And very Nimmo Such and such. Such, 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 such. Right, yeah. There are 48 seconds starting now. Gosh, I love journeys of discovery. Finally, for the first time, the thermal springs of Rotorua. Down to the South Island of New Zealand, the beauties of uh, Milford Town. Who's Alfred Marks, the child. Uh, it's just that he's shouting in my ear, that's all. <laughs> so what do you call that, deviation? I call it torture. <laughs> Derek, uh, an incorrect challenge. There are 40 seconds for you to continue on discovery starting now. From White Tangy I go across the Tasman Sea and land in the fair city. Kenneth Williams' this challenge. Well, he's all, we've already had this mess about New Zealand and geese, and now we've got another Australia place. Nothing before. has to do with discovery. Oh, I Nothing think... Nothing to do with discovery. No, I think he established it was his own personal discovery. Discovery means something quite other than visiting them. No, you? if you go there... If you the don't first... know the difference between visiting something and discovering it, you must be stark raving mad! <laughs> If you don't know the difference between discovering something for yourself for the first time... Nonsense. Discovery is what nobody else has done, you great nit. <laughs> don't you understand what? that? You can you go and look in the Louvre at the Mona Lisa, but you're not discovering it, dear. I discover all kinds oh, of things. help us all. Well, they all end up in the loony bin. This is just rubbish. I no. discover all kinds of things in the Louvre. <laughs> This is a family show, I know. <laughs> and you shouldn't bring your supporters club with you, all shouting up nits whenever you do. Right. Uh, Derek, I disagree with his challenge after all that. 33 seconds on Discovery, starting now. The fine ship Discovery, anchored in the Thames, is a guardian to the shipping coming down towards us. When that sail to the Antarctic... Uh, Kenneth Williams' a challenge. The discovery that is moored in the Thames is not a guardian to the shipping that's coming towards no, us. No, I quite agree. Quite agree don't, say anymore. Oh, don't say anymore. Don't say anymore. I agree with your challenge. <laughs> <laughs> don't say anymore. Please. Just let me say, I agree with you, take the subject, <laughs> and there are 23 seconds on Discovery starting now. The first name that springs to mind is, of course, Galileo. Uh, Clement Freud, shall we? Repetition of, of course. He said it earlier. I he haven't spoken on this subject yet, Great Fool. He hasn't spoken on Discovery. I haven't spoken on Discovery yet, you Great Fool. Trouble is, Kenneth, you speak so much when you're not on the subject that everybody thinks you're on it. But you didn't actually say, of course, on the subject. There are 18 seconds for you to continue on Discovery starting now. He said the world is not flat as everyone had hitherto believed, <laughs> but that it revolves upon its own axis, and that consequently the pull of gravity is such that you cannot pass them before you. Well, they were a Uh, Kenneth, you were speaking then when the whistle went, you got that extra point, and Derek Nimmo is still in the lead. And uh, Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is geezers. <laughs> so would you tell us something about those? Not the, necessarily the ones in Rotorua. You might be... Ro I can't pronounce it. I will uh, for you in a moment. Don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> um, I believe we've had some visitors all the way from New Zealand and Australia who've come over deliberately with the programme. Yeah. Do you enjoy yeah. listening to Just a Minute over there? Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> oh, absolutely ecstatic about it. Here we are. You. <laughs> Here we are. You. How are you doing? All right? <laughs> right. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you really want me to tell you? No. Thank no. goodness. <laughs> right. Derek, the subject is geezers. There are 60 seconds and you start now. Well, of course, I must go back immediately to Rotorua ah. and talk about... Uh, Alfred Marks, the challenge. Yes, I wish he would. <laughs> <laughs> now, look here, Alfred. There's no need to be rude to a fellow panellist. I don't think rudeness has any place in this show. Well, just cut that out immediately. Let's have a little courtesy and gallantry. Shut yes. your face. <laughs> <laughs> I've sat here, I've sat here nice and quiet, listening to all your drivel. 
<laughs> right, so um, after that rude challenge, he's obviously getting the, the feel of the game now, Alfred Marx is. There are 56 seconds on geezers with you, Derek, starting now. The most beautiful one of which is the Prince of Wales' feathers, which you can see go up into the air once every half an hour. And what a magnificent sight it is. Also, I've got one in my kitchen at home, which is very nice, actually, which I have lit by gas. And sometimes, when the weather is cold, I turn it up a little bit and get even warmer water from it. And this works very well, you know, and I prefer it to an immersion heat. I don't know about you, but many of you try geezers because they're jolly good, you know. They're getting a bit out of fashion. Better than coal fires, too. But I find, too, that if you know an old man, you say, hello, you silly old geezer. <laughs> Julius Caesar, he's got a face like a lemon squeeze, I used to sing at one point. I can't quite remember why, but it's a rather nice little song. And then one returns again to... To Italy this time. Was something <laughs> wrong? It was stopped. No, no, you st you packed up, Alfred. No, that's right. It was all very quiet. Yeah. Yeah, it was so boring. <laughs> uh, Alfred, you got in there. What was your challenge? Well, it, just that he hesitated. Oh, I mean, he didn't. Doubt did. uh, there are twelve seconds for geezers with you, Alfred, starting now. Yes, Derek mentioned geezer as appertaining to an old man. Well, of course, this is Cockney rhyming slang, of which I happen to be somewhat of an expert. There is your Peckham Rye, your Dicky, your almonds, and all other things such as your Darby <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> So, Alfred Mars, telling us a little bit cocked about Cockney rhyming slang, move forward, having gained the extra point. When we're speaking when the whistle went, he's now equal with Kenneth Williams and Derek's a few points ahead in the lead. Clement, we're back to you. The subject is Sue. Would you tell us something about that? Sue. In 60 seconds, starting now. During International Aubergine Fortnight in 1972, I was presented by a girl called Sue with a fairly sizable parcel of these delectable vegetables, which are a sort of heliotrope to purple color and have a sheen about them, which is all of their own. It is quite unique, and I'm delighted to be able to recommend them to all listeners. Uh, Kenneth has chanced the... It seems to be a discussion about aubergine and not Sue. I would have thought the same too, yeah, Kenneth. So you, you have a, a point for that, and you have 32 seconds, Kenneth. Sue, with you, starting now. She is, of course, the subject of a very popular song, which I was wont to sing in my youth a long, alas, time ago, and a term which we all have a familiarity with, apropos litigation. To sue a deep person who has your opinion. Uh, most challenged. I thought a hesitation, but perhaps not. I you're, well, you're quite right, it wasn't. And so Kenneth gets another point and he keeps going with the subject and there are ten seconds left on Sue starting now. And when the Manchester Tramway Company sued or were the counter action, so to speak, to a gentleman who said he lost his arm... <laughs> Kenneth was then speaking when the whistle went and got the extra point. And you, Kenneth, have moved in to the lead alongside Derek Nimmo. <laughs> well, that went down well. <laughs> Alfred, it's your turn to begin. The subject is what I know nothing about. 60 seconds starting now. I know nothing about grammar for a start. I also know nothing about almost any subject which you can put to this panel. That is probably why I have been given this question. This starts from my education. I spoke about this recently and probably on another show, about my dear grandfather who was responsible for my learning and teaching me. I remember once as a child taking me on a tram to the British Museum. We went into the room on Egyptology and there standing in the corner was the sarcophagus open and inside a mummy swathed in brown bandages from head to foot with a little brass plate at the bottom saying BC 25. I remember turning to him and saying, what is that? And he said, maybe it's the number of the car that hit him. <laughs> this was the sort of thing that led to my lack of education. As a consequence, I know nothing about almost everything that you can mention. Mention nuclear fission, I know nothing about it. Well, that and most challenging. Revolution what? of education. Education, yes. <laughs> yes. But the audience obviously enjoyed your grandfather. Uh, there are 13 seconds left, Derek, for you to continue. Now continue to take up the subject of what I know nothing about starting now. James, what I know nothing about, except for the tiniest little fact, which was hardly worth repeating, and so I won't. But apart from that, I know very little about memory tricks, or misprints, or clocks, or Lady Hamilton, or wedding photographs, the discovery, or geezer, or sue, or promises, or what I know nothing about. 
So, um, uh, Derek was then speaking when the whistle went, and he has got the extra point for doing so. And, uh, Derek, it's your turn to begin again. The subject, my Geiger counter. <laughs> Would you tell us something about that subject for 60 seconds, starting now? I have a very long and interesting Geiger counter. It was given to me last Christmas, and I've always wanted one. It was made, I believe, in Germany, which I think is quite appropriate because, of course, a Geiger counter was invented by a German professor named Geiger. And that is why this thing is so named, as any poor fool can tell you. I want uh, Clement to... Freud has challenged. It's me. Oh, uh, what's your challenge? He said it was named twice. It was named after him, named after him. Yes, all right, Kenneth, you have the subject and you have uh, 36 seconds for my Geiger counter starting now. Well, I'm singularly ill-equipped to discuss it because I haven't got one, <laughs> but I suppose I could make up something about my Geiger counter in the sense that it might exist in my imaginative <sighs> faculty. Uh, Alfred Marks has challenged. I'm just wondering, as, as Derek is so long and, and, and you know, maybe you can let Kenneth have some of it. <laughs> Poor Kenneth said there were no Geiger counters, and Derek here with a very long one. I don't see why he shouldn't borrow some of it. And then he can talk erudately and articulately on the subject. <laughs> so what's your challenge? That he's so selfish, Derek Nemo says that he a long, thin Geiger counter which he refuses to part with. Well, actually, that wasn't a legitimate challenge. No, but it was worth saying. <laughs> And that's why we love having you on the programme. Thank Alfred, you very because much. Because it's the things that are I worth saying. I introduced the rubbish element. <laughs> <laughs> there are 28 seconds on my Geiger counter, Kenneth, starting now. And were it to be in my hand, I would wave it about <laughs> so that I was able to detect any kind of tremor um, or earth-like activity. Clement Freud has challenged you. What's he challenging about? It's disgusting. <laughs> Which was incorrect, and so Kenneth well, keeps the subject, and he has 20 seconds on my Geiger counter starting now. It would be very useful indeed in detecting metal objects which might represent a threat to the continuance of humanity in general. Uh, Alfred Marx has challenged. I don't think it's the metal which, which, uh, which presents the, the threat. I think it's actually the, the radium content of the metal. But if well, don't you agree that no. radium has pr produced many grave hazards to yes. humanity? I'm talking to the chairman. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you want such a pompous twit. You listen to anybody else. If I wasn't such a pompous twit, I wouldn't be on this show. You would say that again. <laughs> so, Kenneth, as I disagree with the challenge, you have ten seconds left. Are you ready to continue? And it's might be the last round, and it's very close. My Geiger counter starting now. It makes a sound which goes. Ah, 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 <laughs> oh, Derek challenge. Repetition. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and I thought you were a friend of mine. <laughs> yes. When I think of the things you told me last week in Sackville Street. <laughs> And now you sit there doing the dirt on me. <laughs> there are eight seconds, Derek, on my Geiger counter starting now. I use mine for looking for radioactivity in metal if it's buried in the ground, and I found it to be particularly useful in this respect <laughs> on the beaches of... <laughs> well, Derek Nimmo kept going to the whistle and got that extra point on this occasion, so... Um, <clears throat> I will now give you the final score because I'm afraid we do have no more time to play just a minute. Um, Alfred Marx, returning again, contributed wonderful value to the program for which we thank him very much and we hope you'll come back again. He did finish in fourth place, just one point behind Clement Freud, who's done so well in the past, but there were both quite a few points behind this week's equal winners, Derek Nimmo with Kenneth Williams. <laughs> We hope that you've enjoyed listening to Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd.
present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Patrick Moore in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and uh, welcome to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we welcome back this week Patrick Moore after some absence and his success on his first visit to play the game in our guest chair with our three regular competitors. And once again, I will ask them if they can speak for just a minute on some subject that I will give them without hesitation, without repetition and without deviating from the subject. And the first subject that Ian Messeter has thought of is one obviously especially for Patrick. It's a long one. It's called The Fourth Earl Ross, to say nothing of his 42-inch reflector. <laughs> Maybe Patrick can enlighten us, but will you tell us something about that in just a minute, Patrick, starting now? The Fourth Earl Ross, to say nothing of his 42-inch reflector. I assume from the wording of the question that I am to say nothing about his 42-inch reflector. <laughs> and this, in fact, is just as well, for the simple reason he did not have a 42-inch reflector. He never attempted to make anything of the kind. He was, of course, an astronomer. He lived in Ireland. His mother was a most remarkable woman, a pioneer in photography. And uh, when the Earl decided to take, make a hobby of looking at the sky, uh, he elected to build a major instrument, so to do. But, of course, he was, above all, a morphologist. Uh, Clement Freud, chat. Repetition of, of course. You have a correct challenge, and you have 32 seconds to talk about the fourth Earl Ross to say nothing of his 42-inch reflector starting now. I'm not going to say anything about his 42-inch reflector, but I will talk about the Earl of Ross because as a title, it has the extreme rarity of being able to be passed on on the female side as well as that of the male. And the Countess Ross, who in fact does a great deal of good opening exhibitions, picture shows, and in fact being a patroness. Uh, Peter Jones. A repetition of in fact. <laughs> it's yes. in fact earlier on. That is perfectly correct, Peter. You now have four seconds, no, three and a half, to talk about the fourth Earl Ross, to say nothing of his 42-inch reflector. In fact, you could just say, spin it out in three and a half seconds if you wanted to, starting now. He was a dab hand with a telescope, and he used to wield this instrument. <laughs> As this reflector puzzles me, Patrick, can you tell us, did he invent a reflector with... No, the third Earl of Ross made a giant 72-inch uh, re reflector, the largest in the world, and competed in 1845, <laughs> and it remained the largest until 1970. Uh, Right, we move on to the next subject. Oh, yes, at the end of that round, let me tell you, because whoever's speaking when the whistle goes gets an extra point. And it was Peter Jones. He has two. Clement Freud has one. And it's Kenneth Williams' turn to begin. Kenneth, the subject is when it's my go. And it's your go now. And there's just a minute starting now. When it is my go, I should be allowed to get underway properly and not be interfered with by pygmy-like minutiae and rubbish from other people. I should should be given the opportunity to express chivalry and generosity of middle age because youth is always unkind and shouts out, get your gas bag and rudeness whereas I used to the cloistered world or groves of academe as they're sometimes called should proceed evenly calmly through life on some vast panoply of silken garments and beauteous noises. No ugly chance, no discord should interrupt. Oh, I realise I'm being sent up wrong. They've all, they've all just decided. <laughs> They just sat there with no intention of pressing. We were <laughs> absolutely mesmerised, and the audience went through. I could see what they were doing. Yeah, give enough rope, you'll hang yourself. No. <laughs> well, you never hung yourself with repetition, deviation, or hesitation. You kept going with your subject for full sixty seconds till the whistle went. So you get one point for when the whistle goes. Oh, and I'm a in bonus. the lead. I'm in the lead. Yes, with Peter Jones. Uh, oh. <laughs> You have two points for keeping going to the whistle. Uh, Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject is, what makes me laugh? Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, things like, have you ever had this before? Yes, Doctor. Well, you've got it again. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that amuses me. And uh, do you serve crabs here? Sit down, we serve anybody. <laughs> Clement Freud is challenged. Repetition of serve. 
Oh, what a pity. Yes, Brilliant. It's lovely. That's rotten, isn't it? But still, it's a correct challenge, so Clement Roy gets the subject. And there are 47 seconds on what makes me laugh, Clement, starting now. A man who was walking down a street and saw an alarm clock in a shop window and went in and finally said to the man who appeared... Patrick, oh. repetition of man. Oh! Yes. <laughs> man walked down the street and another man appeared. Mm, um, it's a different man. Patrick, we never... <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, we never got his story about what made him laugh, but we might hear what does make you laugh, because there are 38 seconds left starting now. What makes me laugh? Well, of course, the amazing witticisms of the members of the panel invariably do so, but I have found that there's one particular feature of all stories that make me laugh, and that is that they must be funny. Now, this may sound a truism, <laughs> and of course it is, but if a story... Um, Pe Clement Freud. The repetition of, of course. Yes, yes, I'm afraid you have to watch that, Patrick, especially the speed at which you go. Um, what makes me laugh, Clement? There are 24 seconds left starting now. Do you do canine vasectomies? And the chap in the emporium said, yes, I do. To which this customer replied, why on earth do you have a timepiece where I saw it from the pavement? And he said, what else would you expect me to have there? <laughs> Has always made me laugh a lot because I thought it was one of the funniest stories which presumably did nothing at all for the audience. But then we only have... <laughs> Well, maybe a different house. It would go like a bomb, Clement. Uh, you were speaking when the whistle went. You gained an extra point, and so you're, you've just increased your lead now. And will you begin the next round? The subject, phonophobia. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Phonophobia is presumably a fear of loud noises, but could equally be fright of amplification. Uh, Patrick, more. Hesitation, I think. No, I don't think so. In comparison with your speed, yes, but in comparison with his speed, no. Clement, 52 seconds left. Phonophobia starting now. For instance, if Patrick Moore bellowed into one's ear, a phonophobic would go straight to the nearest hospital and ask for <laughs> internment or at least temporary admission, which is the sort of thing that this disease has. In latter-day times, phonophobia is more... <laughs> Uh, Peter Jones. It's not a disease. No, 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 it's a phobia. It can't be a disease. I quite agree. Good to challenge. 33 seconds, Peter, on phonophobia starting now. Well, I don't think Patrick Moore would go up and bellow in somebody's ear. He's got much too good manners for that. He's probably... Um, Kenneth Williams, challenge. Deviation. The subject's phonophobia, not what you imagine Patrick is going to go about doing. Yes, I consider that deviation. He didn't start on the subject. He started on Patrick Moore. Uh, not literally, you understand. Yes. <laughs> there are 26 and a half seconds, phonophobia, with you, Kenneth, starting now. No one would suffer from this, in my knowledge. And they went round with loads of stuff in their ear holes, you know, wax and cotton wool. And then, of course, all the chances of you getting struck by it are minimized immediately. Or could have headphones. They're very useful. A lot of people tell me they use them in laboratories. They have definitely all outside noise. You don't feel a thing. It's like living out of the world. Cotton wool, it rise with aerial hides. Don't know. Uh, Patrick Moore. Uh, deviation. I think he's talking Venusian. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good attempt, Patrick. Um, we'll give you a bonus for, for a good challenge, and Kenneth won for an incorrect challenge. Three seconds left, Kenneth. Phonophobia starting now. And the blood rushed into the pub and said, Mine's a light in the bar, mate. Pour a bucket of cold water all over him. And I think that's a very funny thing. <laughs> Dennis Williams was then speaking when the whistle went. He gained that extra point, and he's now equal in the lead with Clement Freud. They both have five points apiece. <laughs> Patrick, uh, will you begin the next round, please? The subject, Beetlejuice. <laughs> 60 seconds, starting now. Beetlejuice. Now, this could be one of several things. It could, in fact... Uh, Kenneth Williams. He's deliberately impersonating Clement Freud. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what is your challenge? Then? Well, it's not one, really, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so all you did was to interrupt his flow, a thing you get so cross about. He gets a point for that. He continues on Beetlejuice with 53 seconds left, starting now. It might well be a problem of entomology, and this has been suggested time again and very often in the past, and no doubt... Um, Clement Freud. He's deliberately not <laughs> imitating Clement Freud now, which is deviation. I don't think 
that he was deliberately not because he's not an impersonator. An incorrect... No, you can say, you can say that again. <laughs> One of the most individual personalities we know. Uh, Patrick, you have 44 seconds on Beetlejuice starting now. Beetlejuice might easily be juice coming out of a beetle. And if this is done so, then undoubtedly there will be severe repercussions in all kinds of scientific implements. On the other hand, it could also be a star. And there is a body in the sky, and where else could it be, which is very often called Beetlejuice, and it is, in fact, in the constellation of Orion. And I must be very careful not to repeat myself, as I've done in the past, because this is a very serious topic indeed. This particular world is huge. It is truly vast. Just imagine what would happen if you got into a jet, or, for that matter, some other kind of aircraft, and there are plenty around these days, and you attempted to make a complete circumnavigation of this sphere. How long would it take? <laughs> Kenneth Williams, back with you. Percy Harrison Fawcett. That's who Ian Messeter has asked you to talk about in just a minute, starting now. As I know, he was a colonel who disappeared in near the Zwingi River, and he also took with him the son and a friend, Rimmel, I think it was, a book by Cummings, The Fate of Colonel Fawcett, do, does deal with this. Um, uh, uh, Patrick Moore. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes, a full stop, wasn't it? <laughs> Patrick, 44 seconds are left for you to tell us something about Percy Harrison Fawcett, starting now. <laughs> Percy Harrison Fawcett, otherwise Colonel, was not a man whom I personally knew. I have obviously heard of him, and I have the greatest admiration for him, because, as we've heard many times and often, he disappeared up the Zingu River. And if you ask me where that is, I am ashamed to say that without consulting my geographical map, and that is the only kind of chart I would care to look at under these conditions, I really cannot tell you. Percy Harrison Fawcett, as I have said before, uh, Clement Freud. Repetition. Of what? Said it before. Yes. <laughs> I, but I, I am allowed, surely, to repeat the subject name. And I said, yes, you did, but you actually said, as I have said before, before. I have said before, before. Yes. I understand. So, th uh, there are 13 seconds for Percy Harrison Fawcett with you, Clement, starting now. Percy Harrison Fawcett, as I haven't said as yet. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Patrick Fawcett. If you haven't said it before, what is the point of saying it now? I can't <laughs> So what is your challenge? A deviation. Deviation. It's incorrect. <laughs> Clement, you have a, a point. You have seven seconds on Percy Harrison Fawcett, starting now. He was an army officer between the rank of major and full colonel, and was lost on the Zingu River, which is in South America. <laughs> the audience will never know about him now, will they? <laughs> Well, I'll tell them. It was in 1925, for those who are interested. Anyway, Patrick Moore, your turn to begin. The subject is optics. That's what Ian Mester's thought of, and you have 60 seconds to talk about it, Patrick, starting now. Optics are the study of the eyes, and this is a most important branch of science, because in the modern world of technology, what is more important... Uh, Patrick Moore. I just realised I, I repeated important. I've challenged myself. <laughs> That's, he can obviously think as quick as he can speak. It's a correct challenge, Patrick, so you get a point for that. <laughs> and you keep the subject as well. <laughs> and you have 51 seconds on optics starting now. Telescopes, microscopes, many other kinds of instruments, all these are branches of optics. And when you consider them individually or collectively, then you realise how much they do for common people such as ourselves and others who inhabit... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. Common people such as ourselves? <laughs> and he looked right at me. Because <laughs> you're the commonest of them all. <laughs> so what is your challenge? A deviation. I'm not common. Well... <laughs> I shall I put it to the audience? <laughs> now, if you think that Kenneth is common, will you please cheer for him? But if you think uh, Patrick uh, is correct, um, that we're all common, then will you boo for Patrick and all do it together now? Ooh. <laughs> the boo.
boozer have it, so we're all common, Patrick, and Optics is still with you, and there are 36 seconds left starting now. Optics began centuries ago in the Greek period. The first shot was made by a man whose name was Aristophanes. He was a great writer. He was also a great purveyor of what we now call popularization. A repetition of great. Yes, he was too great. Optics is with you, Clement, and there are 25 seconds left starting now. When I did optics at school, one of the most extraordinary manifestations was the prism, which was ever and anon produced by the master in charge of the subject, and rays of light were thrown at it and reflected or refracted out... Um, Patrick Moore. Deviation. Which does he mean? Reflected or refracted? Both. Do you mean both? He said they were uh, reflected or refracted. If he inferred it was the same time, then he's wrong. If he didn't, then he's right. He did not infer it was the same time, so I said Patrick. Then he's right. Then he's right. Thank yes, you very much, you Patrick. See, I object because Patrick Moore is making use of inside information, which is... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's failed him here. It has? Yes. Oh, well, I'm pleased to hear it. <laughs> That's so nice of you, Peter. Clement Freud has got a point. There are two seconds for you to continue on optics starting now. There is a time in the affairs of man which... Clement Freud has increased his lead at the end of that round. And Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. The subject, murder. You've mentioned that quite a few times in just a minute. Will you tell us something about it now in 60 seconds, starting now? Little did she know as she trod the gravel path on that fateful night in 1812 that she was to be the object of derision in the entire neighbourhood when it appeared in the local press that she'd taken the chemical off the flypaper, dissolved it in the bathwater and put it in his soup. <laughs> She was arrested the following day. They desperately tried in all the ways they knew. A blue bottle is buzzing round me and ruining my concentration. But they could not get her off. And so the moment arrived when the judge, placing the black cap upon his head, pronounced the appalling words. Was there to be an eleventh hour reprieve? Was the veritable Bernardo to rush in I... and say, No! Save the poor thing! Never! Clever, uh, remained... Kenneth, I'm sorry, before the judge pronounced sentence, uh, <laughs> Clement Freud challenged. Those were not appalling words. <laughs> But perhaps they got more. But if you were in the dock, they, if you were in the dock, there would be appalling words. What he just said. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Kenneth, you have two seconds to continue on murder, starting now. It is only committed when people are not in their right mind. <laughs> so Kenneth worked very hard, but only got two points in that round. But he's equal in second place with Patrick Moore, still behind our leader, Clement Freud. And it's Peter Jones' turn to begin. The subject, detection. Following murder, detection, just a minute to talk about it, starting now. A fascinating subject and one that has gripped the imagination of some of the best thriller writers of the last two centuries. For instance, I can recall a fascinating uh, count. Patrick Moore. Repetition, he said, uh... Oh, no. I don't mean repetition, I mean, I mean hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> what does he mean? I mean hesitation. Would you like to go outside for a few minutes and think it over? <laughs> Calm yourself. Patrick, you have the uh, correct challenge. You have 47 seconds to talk about detection, starting now. Detection is a very old science, and I think we can call it that. It goes back for centuries. It started, I think, in the 14th decade, and this goes back now a very long way indeed. Detectives are, I feel, some of the most valuable people whom we encounter in our modern lives. They are of various kinds. Some are small, rat-like people with faces like pigs who crawl around doing their best to uncover any trace of dirt, any... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. <laughs> Peter, uh, Clement Freud, you have... Clement has a correct challenge uh, and you have a th 18 seconds left for detection starting now. Some of my favourite heroes of detection are those depicted by Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers, Hercule Poirot, which means...
And uh, what is the score now? Oh, well, Clement has increased his lead at the end of that round, and it's his turn to begin the next round. The subject is Diamond Lil. Would you talk about her for just a minute? In, sorry, in just a minute, <laughs> starting now. Now, Diamond Lil, in fact, was a character who appeared in the poems of Robert Service, a 19th century poet who wrote predominantly about the new frozen north which was beginning to thaw above the 49th parallel where the men who went to the Yukon to make their fortunes lusted um, Peter for Jones women. He didn't write about Diamond Lil. Yes, he's mixing him up with Eskimo Nil. That's what he's doing. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yes. Diamond Lil was a character took that took you a long time, didn't it? No, it took them a long time to make yes. out that my Diamond Lil was a character that May West immortalised, and Robert. Well, Service. I kept looking at you and asking you if it was true or not, but, but you wouldn't answer. I me. thought you said, "Are you Diamond Lil?" <laughs> he never calls you Lil, does he? No, no, but I call him Nil. <laughs> Right, let's get back to just a minute. Diamond Lil was a correct challenge from Peter Jones, and he now has 18 seconds to talk about her starting now. With those enormous hats and the pinched-in <laughs> waist and the pushed-up bust and the diamonds and other jewellery that hung from every... Kenneth Williams. She didn't have any diamonds. She had paste. But she, she, she had diamonds somewhere, because the point was... That's the whole point. She hadn't, you great fool. She was broke. That's why a fool. Don't you know about Diamond Lil? No, but her great hobby and desire was to acquire diamonds. Oh, I see. Yes, that was why that. she was known as Diamond Lil. Mm -hmm. But they weren't hanging from everywhere. <laughs> oh, not everywhere. That would have been impossible. <laughs> Peter. Not with paste, it wouldn't. <laughs> I think we'll continue with um, just a minute. Diamond Lil is the subject. There are nine seconds left. We're still with you, Peter Jones, starting now. Sheer silk stockings with most elaborate garters. This uh, is getting disgusting. I don't want to... It's supposed to be a family show. We don't want to hear about all this underwear and lingerie. It's getting, getting me terribly worked up. <laughs> Deviation. Why? Deviation. <laughs> it's deviation when you get worked up, is it? Yes. <laughs> well, we'll watch out. And uh, leave the subject with uh, Peter Jones, who has five seconds to continue on Diamond Lil starting now. At one end, high heeled shoes. Uh, Patrick Moore. You couldn't have high heeled shoes at both ends. That's why I say at one end. And I'm going to tell you what we had at the other end. <laughs> Luckily, you won't have time. <laughs> Peter, a wrong challenge. You have another three seconds on Diamond Lil, starting now. Parted lips full of promise and eyes that <laughs> blink like... Well, I can remember occasion when Peter Jones took over a subject and he was lying in fourth place and with tremendous style and panache he leapt forward into the lead. He didn't achieve it this time. He did move into second place, which was quite an achievement in one round. Uh, I'm mentioning this because I have to give you the final score because we have to wind up the game. Kenneth Williams was just in fourth place, only one point behind Patrick Moore, and he was only one point behind Peter Jones, who I say had leapt forward, but they were all a few points behind our leader, who once again is Clement Freud. We... Hope that you have enjoyed listening to Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd. Thank you.